Station this evening. Could you please join me in saluting To the flag of the See, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight people. Okay. Um, the hearing of visitors is an opportunity for three minutes for people to uh, address a certain issue. Uh, we welcome the uh, dialogue. However, it's a one-sided dialogue. Basically, the uh, school committee listens, takes the matters under advisement, and uh, we uh, conduct ourselves in a polite and respectful manner. Uh, so I would appreciate everyone uh, considering that fact. So the first person we have up is Mr. Tagger, Jacob Tagger. How are you? Good evening. Good evening. So Jacob, you have three minutes. I think I wrote my name down twice, so it's technically six. Oh, okay. No, I'm joking. I didn't. Okay. Um, uh, the mayor wanted me to start the meeting, so. Okay. Okay, well, this is the school committee's meeting. Um, the mayor asked me to start the meeting, and that's what we will do. The mayor will be here momentarily. So, Mr. Tagger. Okay. Um, I'd like to floor thank yours. you guys for allowing me to speak. Um, again, I told these young people, I used to come to the school committee way back when I was in high school. Um, just a few things I just wanted to discuss with, with you guys. Um, one, I'm in here in full support of uh, Mr. Soufant and our other young people who have been peacefully and trying to be, you know, being constructive. Um, we're trying to come up with an alternative for the current demerit system. Um, so again, I want to make sure I make it known that I fully support these young people trying to change something that they feel is wrong. And uh, the second reason why I wanted to speak is in Mr. Minicello, in your opening statement, you said the school committee is not, and I guess that's a policy, is not allowed to engage, um, you know, visitors. Um, and I watched the meeting and I was disappointed in myself because I should have been here to support this young man when he came before you, your body before. Um, what concerned me is consistency. There was a visitor who spoke directly after this young man and was engaged. Um, and I am bothered. Again, this is not directed towards everyone here. Um, anybody can watch the video and can see. Um, but I, I was concerned about that. I believe we need to be consistent, fair and consistent. So if we're going to mention that policy, we, we need to make sure we follow it. Um, all I'm asking is this young man is heard. Um, and, and you, you know, we, we start the discussion. And not just saying we're going to look at something that these young people find is an issue, but actually get at a table and really try to look at alternatives. Because no one's saying there shouldn't be uh, a system in place. We're just saying maybe this system isn't the right system. Um, and also there needs to be accountability for um, you know, our educators who are handing out or giving demerits. Um, you know, there, there needs to be some system um, to where we're ensuring that they're not being given inappropriately. And I'm a student that went to Brockton High, so I understand the demerit system. I got demerits. Um, but I also had a mother who, if you gave me demerits, it damn sure would have been my fault. I wasn't allowed to be taken advantage of or anything of that nature. Um, and I'm not saying that's the case that's going on. I'm just saying that these young people are trying to be constructive. They're trying to be positive, And I, I support that. I fully support it. And again, I've spoken to, to members of city council and school committee. Um, last year regarding this, and I was told that we were really going to be looking at this, and we had hired someone to come in to, to really look at 
you know, a possible, some possible alternatives. I haven't seen that taking place. Um, so I just urge this, this body to, you know, take this young man seriously because I know myself and a lot of other people do. And again, I'm not insinuating anybody here doesn't, but I'm just going on the record that I'm saying it needs to be taken seriously. Um, and we need to encourage that. And that's what I got, and I, I didn't see that at the last meeting. This young man was not treated with the respect I think he deserved. Um, whether you agree with him or not, he still deserves to, to get that respect. And I didn't feel that from watching that video. Um, and I got that as a young person from my school committee members and, and the, the mayor at that time and the superintendent, and it helped me. Um, so that's really it. I'm just here to support this young man, and hopefully we all can sit at the table and, and look at some, some real alternatives. Um, thank you. Okay, the next person we have is Angel Cosme. So, um, three minutes, thank you, thank you. I too wanna, first of all, thank you for uh, allowing us the opportunity to, to come before you. And I too am here to support Bradley um, but it's bigger than Bradley. To me, it's about the uh, punitive disciplinary system at Brockton High. Um, I am a former teacher, and you know I was trained that the last thing you want to do is is keep a student out of out of class. You want to keep the kid in the class so that he or she can continue learning. And um, there's a lot of problems with the the merit system, the disproportionate students of color, et cetera. All these things we we know, and um, it seems from you know, watching Bradley and, and uh, following him that the last time he was here, it, it seemed very dismissive. And I'm not sure, I guess I'm here to also ask what has been done about that um, issue that Bradley brought up, um, what steps have been taken, and, and also uh, the intent is to have some dialogue, to sit at a table and come up with some ideas or, or just to be heard and actually responded to. I'm also a little bit troubled by the process of having three minutes for the public to, uh, you know, vent or, or suggest or, you know, make comments, and yet there's no process in place for follow-up. That, that to me seems um, problematic in a lot of ways. It's, it's almost like the individual has to then uh, be accountable or, or follow up with, with the respective uh, school committee members, and um, I, I just think there's, there should be a process in place. Um, you said that you take the issues that are being presented under advisement, uh, and so I'm wondering what that actually means. How, how do you take that under advisement? What steps are done? Um, I also wanna say that um, Brockton Interfaith, which I work for, I'm a community organizer with Brockton Interfaith, has been supporting uh, Bradley from, from the moment, uh, you know, be, during the walkout, after the walkout, and it's an issue that we take serious because uh, it was identified by our young people as being problematic and by teachers and parents and so, um, you know, we listen to the community. We like to think of ourselves as a, as a bridge and, and as a voice for the community. So I'm here in, in full support, not just of Bradley, but the bigger issue of the punitive, uh, the merit system, and, and hopes and hope that we can come up to uh, better solutions that are less punitive, um, that, are, that value the individual, um, and that keep kids in school and keep them learning and engaged and respected. Thank you for your time. Okay, Bishop Tony Branch. Bishop, how are you? I'm very well. So I won't need three minutes. God bless everyone here today. Um, so, you know, I wrote notes to talk about the stuff that Bradley had spoken to me about and some of the, the other young people. And I first want to say, you all are doing your job which is very important. But the job has to be based upon the needs of the community. A community in this city that is majority minority. We are underrepresented at this school committee. That's not to say that you can't do your job, but we have specific issues that need to be addressed. So when I looked at the, the film or the video of his appearance here the last time that I wish Bill was here, I'm concerned. I'm concerned that we're being dismissive. May not be anyone's intention, but that's the general opinion that I have, not only as a civil rights leader, but I have that as a professional. 
really concerned about the way he was treated. I'm here today because I'm supporting, although people are tiptoeing around it, uh, saying alternative, I, I think that we need to abolish the demerit system. Clearly, clearly from what folks have told me, the anecdotes that I've have, uh, uh, read is that there's inconsistency in the application of the demerit system in the Brockton Public Schools. We're seeking the uh, a restoration uh, discipline, uh, and I think that that's appropriate. I think that we know that there's data out there. We know that the Department of Education has data. We know that this has been implemented in school departments across the nation, so it's something that can be done. The reason why it would not be done in the Brockton Public School is because we lack the courage to do it. And what I'm suggesting to you today is that whatever you do, whatever you do when you get home, have the courage to make change because the end users are demanding this. I disagree with Angel. Angel said that there is no, uh, uh, there's a lack of follow-up. There is a uh, follow-up. The follow-up is elections of the school committee. The follow-up is elections of the city councilors in this particular city. So there is follow-up. We need to be aggressive. Now, folks, there are signs of oppression, specifically racial oppression. For people of color, it is the Confederate flag for some of us in the religious community, it's the swastika. But for people of color, it's a term housemaster. Now, I, I, I'm not going to be like they are. I'm telling you, that needs to go. It's an oppressive sort of title, and in an environment where we are talking about children of color, housemasters is inappropriate. So whatever the school committee comes up with, I would strongly urge the community to get back in here, and I would strongly urge the community to have the school, school committee listen to them and to make changes and make sure that terminology is gone. So what are we talking about, folks? We're talking about courage tonight, and I'm asking that you have that courage. Listen, God bless you. Keep doing what you're doing. My apologies for being tardy. I hope I don't get demerits for that. Um, the, uh, we'll, we'll continue with the, uh, the hearing of visitors. And it looks like, uh, Bishop, I did hear most of your remarks. Uh, and I'm always willing to talk to you. Uh, can't read without my glasses. Manny Mendez is up next. Hi, sorry for my appearance. I wasn't expecting to speak today. I'd like to thank whoever brought uh, watermelon as we discuss racial disparity in the school system. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, the thing I'd like to say to you all, everyone here is uh, a bit older, a bit more experienced, and I ask that you don't get annoyed or angry by any of the things that people after me have to say because anger and annoyance is nothing but the ego defending your perceptions of your reality. You have an understanding and you have these prejudices about how you expect things to go and anger and annoyance defends that. So that's your ego speaking, that's not the best you. So empty your cup and make sure you listen to these youthful people as people instead of just black kids and you'll start to understand that, oh, Maybe they have something to say. Because as long as you look at them as black kids, you are nothing but white people. And that's problematic for both of us, I think. Finally, the thing that I have to say clearly is I'm 24 years old, almost 24. And I came to this school and I graduated, luckily. I was in the lowest rung of classes, the lowest grades. And the majority of the kids that I went to school with, who are colored, are either dead, in jail, or doing who knows what. I'm sure you've seen some of their faces on Facebook and the news. Now, I'm sure there's a thought in your head where it makes you think, well, that's their responsibility. But the responsibility started with the school system because it's designed to create better human beings. You are responsible for human beings, the best of us. And to degrade us and put us in a systematic box 
that allows only us to recognize the worst of ourselves instead of the best of ourselves only perpetuates the cycle you get to judge us by. Please open your mind to what these kids behind me have to say. Because they've been studying, they've been learning, and they've been paying attention. Something many, many people older than them have not been doing because your life is busy. My name is Manny. I'm a citizen of this city. I grew up here. Some of my friends are dead because they rejected the school system, which was supposed to take care of them. You are responsible. You are. Thank you. All right, looks like uh, next on our list is uh, Javon Dixon. Hello, it's nice to see all of you. <clears throat> Sorry, I have a bit of a sore throat. I just wanted to speak on one subject that revolves around the demerits, and it's the addition of another period added to the Brockton High schedule. I am a student, I go to the school still, I am in my senior year, and I do believe that with the demerit system, there needs to be an addition, or at least an increase to the amount of demerits needed for an accumulation. Because we are used to five periods, and for some of us, it's easy to avoid the 21 demerit you know, accumulation, but for six periods, it might be hard for some more. And I would just like to see that you know, just a bit more eased out because I'd like to see my other students survive the school year and actually be able to go out and do some of the things they would like to do. Thank you. All right, Javon, thank you. Uh, Caligano Chambers. Caligano, if I didn't pronounce that correctly, you can help me with it. Cologino. <coughs> yes. Yes. Um, nice to see all y'all. I am uh, Colosiano Chambers. I am 15, and I go to North. I am going to be going to Brockton High next year, and I am speaking on the behalf of the class of 2020. There is the demerit system there is designed for people like me or people like of any minority basically to fail. And it is basically saying that I will probably barely get through my high school year or barely graduate because of demerits that I'm getting or maybe because I'm going through things that these teachers or people in the school don't understand. And that's the thing with this new generation is there, there will be no talking. There will be getting kids, kids getting kicked out. There will be kids fighting back. There will be kids doing things that they're not supposed to do because the way that the school designed it. Um, we need, I, I believe we need to create a structure where there is students, parents, and teachers coming together. And I believe that, that the new generation aren't communicating with their parents, so what makes you think that they're gonna communicate with a teacher? And that's because the teacher or anybody in the school doesn't really see eye to eye or see the same view. And it's really a shame and it's disappointing me because I have to go through that. The kids that are coming into this school have to go through that. The people that are going through the same things that all these kids are going through coming into the school has to go through that. And I feel like it's not fair. Um, we need to create an environment where teachers and students are, pertain are pertaining to each other's views, where teachers come and talk to these students because there will, there will be a lot of violence in the school because of what these kids are coming in and not getting. I will, I will be disciplined, but at the same time, I'm getting stooped down to many levels, which is not gonna cope well with other students that's coming in, or me, because I feel like you should talk to me as a person, just like I'm talking to y'all as people. I feel like I should be treated equal, just like every person should be treated equal. And I just wanna say that you look over those views, 
and look over the things I said and look over the thing that many people said here today because it's the truth. And I don't know if y'all see it or not, but I hope y'all see it. Thank you. Thank you, Cologino. Uh, E.T. Okenbur, and I, help me with the pronunciation. Okenbur. Thank you. Okenbur. Okay. Hello. Um, my name is Atenosa Okenbur. I'm a senior at Brockton High. Um, so first, I just want to be honest. Um, the demerit system has not personally affected me in, in any way. It's been, it's a different experience for me because, you know, I'm in, I'm an honor student. I take AP classes. I get good grades. You know, I'm not someone who gets in trouble. But um, from my peers who are in like uh, CP or CPA classes, it's a different experience for them. And it would be selfish of me not to care for um, my classmates and my friends. So um, I have an idea of, an, of a solution. And basically, it's just the kind of culture that goes around in Brockton High is obey or else. So I know you guys want to um, you know, keep students in school, but it doesn't make any sense if students don't feel comfortable there or welcomed. So I feel like an alternative to that is creating an environment where we, like um, Cologino said, uh, a relationship between students and teachers and parents, because that can help you know build trust between students and teachers, and therefore uh, we won't need to take disciplinary action. Um, and I noticed that there is an emphasis on like zero tolerance, that policy, and I feel we should shift that to restorative practices. So, you know, PBIS principles, pre prevention, um, behavior, uh, intervention, and yeah, mediation, speaking, and finding out the core root of why students are acting out. and. I feel like it's very uh, lazy to just, to use, well, yeah, to use the demerit system because we're just putting off um, students' personal problems when we could really target the core root of why students don't act out or why they're b being late to school. We can, f you know, research more and investigate and show that we care about the our students, really. and. Yeah, so one specific um, solution that I have is having mandatory meetings between teachers and students every two or three weeks in school, uh, throughout the school year, so we can touch upon you know, the academic year and where we're at. It's really just an emphasis on communication because you know, if I come into school, I'm disagreeing with my teacher. I'm, I'm less likely to learn and be engaged with my teacher if I'm not having uh, a healthy relationship with them. And therefore, I act out or I get kicked out. So I just feel like the core root of our problems is we, we don't have a relationship with each other. And I feel like in order to combat that, we need to have a concentrated effort in establishing that relationship with parent, teacher, and students. Um, yeah, thank you. Okay, next up on our list is uh, Bradley Souffrant. So I'm back, and basically you've heard the community. The community has spoken. I'm here on behalf of the thousand signatures that we got on the petition to change this very system. Now, we understand that you guys have been working in trying to implement Massachusetts State 222 within the school system. We know that you guys have been working in terms of trying to make some changes within the schools. In no way, shape, or form are we saying that you guys are not trying. What we are trying to say is that we have more 
and effective ways for us to go about disciplining our students in terms of helping them grow in terms of understanding exactly why they are getting disciplined or in trouble. There needs to be a communication there. See, there's a lack of communication between adults and youth. I can be in a class and my teacher might be looking at me as if I am a student that does not do his work and is always getting in trouble. Blah, 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 blah. And then I might be a student like, I don't like this teacher. I don't understand. But if we never have that outlet, that platform for me to express myself and for her to express herself, then there will always be a misunderstanding. What we want to do is we want to implement restorative practices within our school system. Okay, because there is this thing in our country called school to prison pipeline. It is real. And the demerit system is the no zero tolerance policy. And it stems from that exactly. In our community, we want to make sure that our youth grow up to be successful. And a way to help them do that is to have adults and people of you know, success and, and just older people in general who's graduated, who's been through a lot of things with experience, talk to them. We can reach the youth. We can reach the students who actually get in trouble. We can reach them instead of just disciplining them. Because once you get the merits, I may not just under, I may not understand exactly why I get it. But if I had that person to talk to me, I bet you that would have been the first and last time I got it. So I feel like maybe we should implement programs, maybe even after school, where we have people of the community talk to our youth, especially the ones who get disciplined. You know, let's find ways to work together. Because I cannot do this alone, and I'm sure you guys can't do this alone. So let's put our minds and resources together. Let's bridge the gap and come to an understanding of how we're going to move forward from this. Because we're not going to give up. We're going to continue pushing, and we're going to continue trying to implement a change within our school system. And maybe this could become a domino effect for the other schools in Boston who go through the same things that students in Brockton High go through. You know? And I just want, I just want to be heard. I just really want to be heard. And I hope that I was heard today. And I hope that everyone who came up today was heard also. We want to implement change in our school system. That is it. Positive change. Work with us. We're not your enemies. We are people in your community. Work with us. We're extending our hand. Thank you. Do you have a, uh, can I grab this for a second? Oh, no, I, I got mine right here. Never mind, I got it, I got it, I got it. All right, I believe that completes our uh, hearing of visitors for this evening. Thank you very much to all the folks who uh, came in to speak, and I can assure you that uh, all your comments are going to be very seriously considered by the members of the committee and uh, the school administration. Uh, at this point in the meeting, we go to the consent agenda. This is the uh, manner in which the school committee is able to act on a number of routine items of business as one block to help keep the meeting moving along. Uh, however, uh, any member of the committee may request that any individual item in the consent agenda be removed for separate consideration. So at this time, I'll ask if any members of the committee would like to remove any specific items from the consent agenda. Mr. Sullivan. Item B. Item B. Okay. Anyone else? Mr. Minicello. Item C. Okay. Well, we've only got three left. Anyone else? <laughs> no? Okay. So at this point, I'll entertain a motion on approval of the consent agenda minus items B and C. Motion to approve consent agenda minus items B and C. Okay. Motion's been made. Second, Ms. Plant. Motion has been made and properly seconded to approve the uh, consent agenda minus items B and C. All in favor? Approved unanimously. Mr. Sullivan, item B. I'll be quick. I just want to explain what item B is all about. Because Irving's Home Center is a brand new donation person for the school department this year. They have come forward and donated uh, rubbish barrels with covers 
that has Irving's on the front of it, and they've donated six of them, which comes out to about $250. At the same time, Brockton Housing Authority Executive Director Tom Tebow has also donated the space and $100. The space will be used to place these containers where people can drop off supplies for the, for the kids. These supplies are going to be donated to all the elementary schools in Brockton or any kid who needs something. If it's there, he can have it. Uh, this donation process is going to start probably next week. Uh, what I was going to do is give a list of the donation sites that are available. I'm going to put one at my house at the front door is going to be at 9 Peyton Court on the north side of Brockton. The Camp Hello High Rise on South Main Street, Building A, and the south side of Brockton. Manning Towers on West Elm and Goddard Road, Central Brockton. Caffrey Towers, Crescent Street, and it will be Building A, which is on the east side of Brockton. Bel Air Towers on Bel Air Street which is on the west side of Brockton, and Sullivan Tower on Colonel Bell Drive, which also was on the west side of Brockton. And part of the donation from the Housing Authority is these coordinators are going to pull in the barrels every night so things just don't disappear. They're going to put them out in the morning and take them in at night. And if they get filled quickly, give a call and we'll go and pick them up. Uh, and like I said, all these donations are going to be recorded. People are going to know what's in there and who's going to get what. There's going to be no secrets. And all the schools are available, and anybody can apply for anything that's in the barrels. It, it used to be Walgreens that was supplying a ton of uh, school supplies to us. And Jim Mahoney at Walgreens has disappeared. And I can't find out where he is or what's happened to him. So, hopefully, some of the watches Channel 12 is listening to you. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. I'd like to know. <laughs> yeah, come on back, Jim, wherever you are. And anyway, this program is going to start the end of next, the beginning of next week. Thank you. Any other mem members want to put a barrel at their house? We can get a couple more barrels. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There you go. I've recruited another location for you already, Tim. All right. So motion's been made to accept item B. Second, Miss Asac. All in favor? Opposed. Approved unanimously. Thank you very much, uh, Tim. Mr. Minicello. Um, we have a generous donation to Brockton High School from uh, an organization, uh, PPG Manufacturing in Avon. Uh, they've awarded four $1,000 grants to Brockton High School uh, in order to help fund the following projects, uh, thermal imaging and accessories for smartphones, uh, DNA, RNA protein modeling kits, uh, chemical probes, and Stella Dynamic Systems modeling software license. Um, we um, had some students earlier in the year, well, not too long ago, maybe a month ago, who uh, this sounds like it's right up their alley. Um, so I just wanted to point that donation out and um, express on behalf of this body uh, our appreciation for the generosity of uh, P PPG Manufacturing of Avon. Mr. Michelle? Uh, motion to accept the donation to Brockton High from PPG Foundation. Second. Second. All in favor? Approved unanimously. <clears throat> Thank you very much for both of those generous donations. At this time, uh, I'll turn the meeting over to Deputy Superintendent Thomas for the report on teaching and learning. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, first, I want to report on Final Site. That's our new website that's ready to uh, launch right around August 1st. Um, I want to thank um, Michelle Bolton and Kathy Ettinger 
uh, and all the people that worked with her to uh, put together this new website is uh, it's a major undertaking. Um, we'll send out a connect ed call to all parents and we will um, We'll, we'll get the word out um, on local cable access to exactly the date that we'll launch. Um, so we spent hours on this. It started in October of 2015. Um, we transferred thousands of pages from the old site to the new site and we eliminated a lot of pages that were not used anymore. So uh, it was a lot of work by um, a lot of people. So we're hoping to get it off by August 1st, um, but again, we will announce through a um, through some advertisements of how people can know when it launches. Uh, it's going to be a great site, especially if you're using it with your mobile device. Um, right now, the site really struggles if you're trying to look at it on your BlackBerry or iPhone. And as you know, it takes 20 minutes to load a page. So it's going to work a lot me better with a, the mobile devices. Um, it is compliant with Section 508 for people with disabilities. Uh, it also has a translation tool for people that do not speak English as their first language, so that is going to be a huge help. It is going to also, um, at one point, um, a little bit down the road, it will have the online Decker store. So people that, um, the thousands that have graduated from Brockton High School over the years can now go online and, and buy Brockton High gear, um, you know, if they're in other states or other countries, so that's major because a lot of people do call and people I went to school with asking, how do I get, you know, Brockton High Boxer gear and um, I can't come back to Brockton. I live in California and how do I buy something? So that's going to be put in place and I want to thank uh, Paula Mincello for Decker. She's worked hard um, on, you know, putting that together with Michelle. So I want to, again, thank everybody involved and a Connect Ed call will go out to all parents and families in the community to let them know exactly um, the date will launch, but we really are hoping for August 1st. So I don't know if anybody has any questions on the, the new website. Uh, Michelle can come up and help us answer any of those. Once right. I put it up, we'll have all kinds of questions. Perfect. So moving on to an update on the charter school. As you know, the superintendent wants to keep you updated on the, the opening of the new New Heights Charter School. Um, right now, we have 170 um, release forms that have been filled out for parents um, for allowing us to release the students' records to the charter school. That includes 65 sixth graders, 60 seventh graders, and 45 eighth graders. Um, later this week, I believe it's Thursday, uh, Omari Walker, who has, have we been, work, we've been working closely with um, to basically support our students who are leaving the Broughton Public Schools and uh, uh, deciding on going to the charter school. We have been supportive of um, you know, working with the charter school with our special education team, uh, our transportation team, because we do have to provide transportation to the charter school, um, and getting them the records on time, the student records on time. So they have thanked us a few times in emails um, for working with them so well. And again, the, these are our students. They're Brockton students, they're Brockton kids, and no matter where they go to get their education, we have to be supportive of that. So I just wanted to give you an update on the number. Again, the total is 170 at this time. Um, and what I'm hearing, uh, um, obviously, they are still ready to open um, in the beginning of September. So we're going to meet this week to talk about the students who have signed up for the charter school that do have IEPs the special ed education students, um, to make sure that the services will be provided to them um, the same way they provided in the Brockton Public Schools. They need to be provided in for them at the charter school. And we're also going to talk about transportation and see what students live um, two miles away from the charter school and uh, how we will transport them to school. So if you have any questions on that, I'll be happy to answer any of those. Mr. Sullivan. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Just one question. Uh, the transportation supplied by Brockton Public Schools? Yes, it is. Uh, that's the total cost? Uh, that's in this year's budget. We included three additional buses um, to be used for charter school transportation. Uh, ch the charter school transportation will be in our tier two, which run our middle schools. Um, that's where we have the flexibility uh, in the busing where we can actually fit them in. Um, so they'll be in tier two and uh, we did put three additional buses in the budget for uh, the charter school children. 
just one question, Mr. Thomas. Do you think it's fair to the people of Brockton that the they're um, paying for a, a school bus for a charter school? It's, it's because they're Brockton students. Um, the law changed a long time ago. Um, we have to do it for um, students that attend Cardinal Spellman we have to, that live in Brockton. Um, we have to do it for students that tr attend Trinity uh, that live in Brockton. So as far as supporting the students and the families in Brockton, um, you know, it's not easy because when budget, the budget's tough, but um, it, is, it is part of us supporting students in the, that live in the city of Brockton. Just one final question. The uh, breakfast and lunch, is that supplied by Brockton Public Schools as well? No, they will have to um, go out and um, procure their own uh, food service contract. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, other than busing, is there, are there any other services or activities that we have to make available to charter school students? Uh, no, we, there were questions asked about athletics um, and students participating in after school activities like intramurals and those kind of things and you do not have to provide those services. Um, and anything outside of the regular busing, the, the to and from school, uh, so if they're gonna, going to run field trips or um, any other late buses um, in the afternoon because if they want to have late programs, they have to pay for that on their own. So I have put them in touch with um, the management at first student uh, so they can set up in, um, any of those you know transportation services and they have to pay directly to first student for that okay thank you you're welcome and that's it for the report of the superintendent deputy superintendent yep. acting superintendent and I, I, have, I do have items to refer to. Okay, what about um, this? Well, um, items to refer to subcommittee. Do any members or the administration have uh, items that they would like us to refer to one of the many subcommittees of the school committee? Uh, I might try to schedule another finance subcommittee. Uh, for the first week of August? Absolutely. Um, so. How does August 2nd look, Tom? Yeah, August 2nd is good because our school committee meeting is the 16th, so it doesn't conflict. Um, so if people um, could let me know if that works. And um, I believe, Mrs. Sullivan, 6.30 is better for you, correct? 6.30 is a better time than 6 o'clock, right? Okay. So why don't we try to pencil in an August uh, 2nd finance sub yep. for 6.30 and uh, Mrs. Owls can tell us what, what's available, if the Arnone's available. Um, Mr. Minichello? Yes. Yeah. Can we put a 30-minute policy meeting in at 6.30 before and then make finance at 7? That's fine with me. Okay. I do six and six thirty. Can people make it by six? Um, well, I, I don't think I don't think Mrs. Sullivan. Oh yeah, you can't make six. Okay, no, I mean, that's the okay. policy would need to be at six thirty, and then the that's why it starts asked. at seven. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that we we were also talking about we threw out the July twenty sixth. I see in the notes of our finance subcommittee meeting. Um, do you think that we need yeah. a finance? Um, for next Tuesday, or do you think the following Tuesday is better? Will we? I think the following Tuesday would be better because I think by that time, um, I think the mayor will have more information from the, uh, the state budget. Yeah, I, I'd feel better with the August second. Okay, day. that's fine. Yeah, because at the we're finance, talk about that a little bit in the budget stuff. update here. Okay, but I think that's, that's fine. Uh, Great. All right. So if people can put that in their calendars. Um, Mr. Sullivan, you're putting that in your calendar, right? Atta boy. All right. Excellent. Okay, great. Thank you. August 7th. 6.30 for policy, 7 o'clock for finance. Anyone else? You good with those? Yep. Okay. Good. Might move right along then. And okay, on the un unfinished business, um, I know at, at last Monday's finance committee, 
meeting. Uh, there were questions about um, what the budget cuts and the teacher cuts have done to the um, implementing the new schedule at Broughton High School and also with the cuts, um, how they will affect the middle school and the elementary school class sizes. So um, we're going to start with a presentation from Principal Wolder um, and I believe Mr. Perkins. So they're going to come down and, and join us and present uh, about the cuts at the high school and the effect on the new six period day and then after that we'll have um, Deputy Superintendent Barry will and um, Executive Director Cliff Murray report on the elementary and middle schools. Do you need this, nope. Ms. Fulton? Thank you, though. Good evening. Uh, last Monday I was asked about the impact of the cuts. Um, and so what I sent to you in last Friday's packet was hopefully a way for you to kind of visualize what it takes to schedule a school that we're anticipating over 4,300 students in September. Um, right now, we're at 4,205, as history has shown us in the, over the summer and through September, Brockton High usually enrolls up to 200 additional students, and we tend to lose only about 25 over the summer. So we're looking at uh, over 4,300 students. And what the six period day schedule did, which was what parents asked for, was it gave more opportunities in the schedule for students so that they could take more classes. And so for the 4,300 students, we went from, they have five periods that we have to fill to now they have six periods that we have to fill. And in order to fill those schedules, we need to have people in place. And so the people that we discussed last week, and I used the example of foreign language, and that's also in here. The, we lost, according to the cuts at this point, uh, one Chinese teacher, one Latin teacher. We have two Chinese teachers. We have, in order for students to qualify for a four-year school, most four-year schools require two years of a language. So we would be able to offer Chinese one and two and Latin one and two. We would have to eliminate three, four, five, and IB, which means those students on the accelerated tracks would no longer have access to those classes because we need to make sure that students pursuing the Chinese classes would have those classes. And so in September, that would mean we would eliminate Chinese three, four, five, and IB, and we'd be able to offer Chinese one and two because that one person could only cover those classes. The same with Latin. Uh, so anyone interested in the IB diploma track uh, would then only be able to pursue it if they took Spanish. Those students who have taken Chinese or Latin to this point are not prepared for IB Spanish, so they would no longer have access to the IB. So that helps you to see the overall impact of a decision like that. It's just, it's not just eliminating classes and fewer kids taking it. It has a greater impact for students junior and senior year who chose a path that we would no longer be able to offer them. Uh, for our history courses, our social science courses, uh, we would el end up eliminating uh, the elective courses so that we could offer U.S. History 1 and 2 and World History. By eliminating those elective courses, we now have students that we add to that 1,200 students. So I told you they had already two or more periods in the day that we were not able to fill. And so when we discussed last week the impact of not having people in place uh, on the new schedule that we have, those are the things that we're looking at. In English, we looked at how we could move people around and offer more elective opportunities. And so we were able to look at moving multiple classes around and over the span of a year offering 25 semester electives, which would take care of about 750 of those students who have uh, two or more DAs. If we don't have those people in place or we have fewer of those people in place, that means fewer electives will be able to be offered and more students will be without uh, a class 
twice a day, sometimes longer than that. And so that's the way we had to look at it. Uh, that's the way I explained it to you in the information I sent. I sh sent the schedule that shows you it's 52 pages to schedule a school that big with the number of courses we offer and the way we have to blend some things. Uh, you'll see 52 pages of a bunch of small lines with numbers and names. Uh, and then I followed up with some information that kind of broke that down for you, uh, what it means we're looking at. Um, and so at this point, um, based upon whatever happens, we will look at who we get back and we have to schedule a school. And basically, mid-August, mid we have to reschedule no matter what. So um, ultimately, I'm in a holding pattern waiting to hear what the school will have so that we can figure out where we need to eliminate some things um, and or where we need to add things. Thank you. Um, so you're expecting about 4,300 students when everything is said and done um, in September. What did you ultimately end up with last year? Uh, last year, by the end of the year, we were at 42, I think we ended around 42.22. We were up at one point to 42.65, um, and we ended with around 42.22. Okay. Um, so you are anticipating an, an increase in the number of students in the school this year then? Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned that students on the IB diploma track would not be able to complete that program, if I understood you correctly? If we lose the two language teachers that uh, were given a RIF notice, that would mean we would only be able to offer the languages at the first two years and not the second or the third and fourth year. So the kids who were in those classes, IB or not, uh, would not have access to those. Those students who chose the IB uh, path, diploma path, or just IB courses, would not have access to that, those courses in that language. And so we would still be able to offer it in Spanish, but only in Spanish. I see, so it would just change the choices that they had to, basically to one language. It would change the choices, and they would have to make those choices prior to junior and senior year. So they would need to have already taken, especially a student looking to do the IB diploma track, they would have need, they need to take three years of a language prior to starting IB. So those students who had Chinese, for example, and they're in their junior year starting an IB program, uh, they would not be able to choose the diploma track if they took Chinese or Latin because they don't have the background in Spanish. Oh, all right, I see. So they're, they're at, if they're going into their junior year, they're at the point of making that choice, right. and depending on what language they've already taken, they may not have that option. Right. Okay. All right. Um, and let's see. You mentioned that there would be some students without a class for two periods a day. Do you have any idea how many students would be in that uh, situation? At the end of the school year, when the guidance counselors left for the summer, we were at 1,193 students. Okay. All right, that's all I had. Thank you very much. Okay. Talking about the foreign languages, which languages are offered in the middle schools and how many students complete some of their foreign language requirement prior to getting to the high school? For college consideration, none of them. You have to take the language in high school to be considered having completed your language requirement when you're applying to college. So for the students who are taking languages in the middle schools, and uh, Liz can probably speak to the okay. numbers. I know they take Latin, Chinese, and Spanish. I don't know if there are other languages. But those students then come into Brockton High School ready for um, Spanish 2 or Spanish 3 instead of starting in Spanish 1. Uh, the same with Chinese or Latin. So when they come into high school, to meet the requirement when the college is looking at them, they need to do their language at the high school. But where they start in high school is dependent upon whether or not they took language in middle school. Okay. All right, I'll follow up with Ms. Barry on that. Okay. Tom. It's a little older. Um, if given the opportunity to um, receive more teachers back that have been given the RIF notices, how would you, which, which um, which areas would you sort of prioritize in terms of filling, filling in, you know, backfilling, so to speak? Which subjects? And, and how many in each area? 
Uh, to prioritize, obviously, I would want the two language teachers back because yeah. they teach a large number of students that we would have no place for them to go. And that would just add to the number of students who didn't have a class. So I would start there, definitely. Uh, in math and science, uh, a full complement of math and science teachers is, is necessary. In terms of our state testing and in terms of our requirements, those are the areas where we still have a number of students who struggle and end up taking remedial courses prior to passing the exam. So I would say that would be the next priority. In terms of uh, English and social science, I think ultimately where we need to create electives, uh, those are the two areas where we can make the most changes to create new electives so that we can pull some of those students out of DAs. So th they're equally important in terms of how many people we have returned to us so that Ultimately, what we don't want is to say we created a schedule for students to have more opportunities, and when we implement the schedule, they have fewer opportunities. And at this point, that's where we stand. And so getting those people back gives us a chance to create elective opportunities for students to have courses they wouldn't otherwise have had, and that will then get them into some classes and, and actually increase the, the rigor and the opportunity for them. Okay. Um. Correct, uh, clarify for me, um, my, my perception of adding the additional period was, in my mind, I thought that, um, you know, students who were, uh, did not have the ability or the time to take an additional class because of, you know, having a full schedule, you know, this would open up the door that, like, if a kid is in, in band or something and, um, was precluded from you know going into a foreign language because there was only so many periods a day that it's taught and so this you know opens up another slot if the, the, the you know foreign language teacher you know is going to be teaching another period so students can slide into another slot um, but is, is it my understanding that you're also creating brand new electives or brand new classes I, I, I thought that I guess in my mind I was thinking we we're, we're going to use what we have and you know you have to remember the, uh, that in the 2015 school year uh, the family and consumer sciences department was eliminated so those classes that existed are gone yeah. and so that was almost 2,000 seats that in coming into this school year we don't have yeah. so when we created those opportunities for students who wanted six or seven things to have those six or seven things and that was 150 or so kids who have band and and another hundred or so who have language or the course department it also made that requirement for the other 3,000 plus kids who who didn't have those things and they still need something in their schedule. So it did address the kids who had banned and wanted a language, assuming that we are able to get those teachers back and give them that language. Um, but what it also did was looked at every other kid in the school and said the requirement now is the same for you too. And so that means we have to have classes for them to go to. And with the cuts from the previous year, the impact that it had this past year meant more kids in a DA. And so we saw that there were more kids in a DA. Um, with a six period day, it means 1,920 seats that those people would have been able to help us fill for those kids. We no lo longer have those educators to provide that. So now we have to figure out what are we going to do with these kids since those classes don't exist anymore, which is why we're looking at now we have to create electives to fulfill those requirements that we've given to students. So without creating these electives, there's not enough opportunities currently now by just adding another another period right if um, I could if I could just add uh, music art in, in the uh, vocational programs the business programs are packed right now with right. our schedule and there's right. 1200 kids that have two DAs and without those 18 other positions we're now adding more kids to that 1200 with no place to go with the with the extra teachers we then can create some electives for those students to go into so you're actually going to be creating new curricula? Yes, and so my sense of urgency, I think you can understand why 
I feel like if we don't move soon, we're in big trouble because we have two weeks to reschedule a school, but we also need to inform educators that we've made these kinds of changes and give them time to prepare for classes that they will now have to teach. Okay. Um, all right, thank you. So, because I guess I'm struggling this a little on the same line as Tom because I understand we've added a whole nother period of classes, but teachers that taught three classes now teach four. So it would seem as though if you had the same number of teachers, and I understand there's a reduction, but if you had the same number of teachers, theoretically, I mean, that would be a 33% increase in productivity in, in terms of being able to teach 33% more classes with if the you, same number of staff. If you look at, let's just say English, every teacher gets another period, but every kid has to take English one, one course per year. So the teachers can teach more classes, but when you fulfill that the kids have taken their one course, and then the other kids have taken their one course. In the, so when you look at what kids have to take, this is why taking those people and saying, now we have to create other courses for the kids. It's about the kids. It's, it, can they do more? Yes, if we have them, they absolutely can. But the fact the kids have to take more things and they need one English class, one math class, one science class, one history class, and you have two other periods there that you're trying to now fill for kids, um, then you do need those people to create something else to put them into. So their productivity is more, but the requirement of the kids increased, and so we need them to do the more for the kids who now have to take more classes. So not the current proposed cuts in the budget, but <clears throat> last school year, how many permanent teaching positions did you lose, positions that were not recalled? The family and consumer sciences, there were four of them. Uh, one retired and it wasn't filled, and three others were job eliminations. And so those three positions were eliminated. Okay. The other positions were not direct instruction positions, so I'll just yeah. speak to those. Yeah, so eight teaching positions. There were, there were four. There were six positions total that were not restored. There were four of them that had direct instruction okay. uh, with students. So going back to what you would have had last year, even without the cuts, you're looking for a substantial increase in the, in the amount of faculty. If we went with the number of faculty that we had prior to the cuts, the previous year, we could have met the requirements that we placed on the students, um, and there would have been smaller class sizes, which was one of the things that, that the schedule talked about. So had there been a, a few rifts in a few departments along the way to prepare for that, and we had those other positions to fulfill the elective requirements that kids have, um, it would have balanced. But because of, of finances and because that the cuts that had to be made the previous year, and then you add the cuts that are being made this year, then we end up with kids who have a six period day schedule that we can't fill. Okay. I, I guess, uh, just speaking for myself, I guess just a little of my frustration is that we've known this was coming for a year, and we're sitting here six weeks before the first day of school scrambling. Um, so I, I just think that puts the school committee in somewhat of a difficult position. Seems like we could have been addressing this long before the middle of July. I've been saying this for a long time. Okay. And so, and this is where my frustration, and I said I have a sense of urgency, because where you're frustrated, I have to open a school for 4,300 kids, and I don't want them just sitting. And I would like to be able to tell people what they're going to teach and, and schedule a school. So we all have a great sense of urgency here, and it's important that as we work together, we figure out a solution. Um, it, it, there is, it's frustrating all around. Yeah. Tom? Uh, this is um, certainly not a novel new idea, but um, you know, we're preparing kids for college and beyond. Um, 
to me, if, if we don't have the, the, the optimal number of staff that we'd like, um, then I think that we should perhaps try to design um, something similar to college, meaning that we have, you know, sort of have a, an elective that's in a seminar setting, utilize this room, utilize the auditorium, the big, you know, the, the seminar rooms, you know, up in the high school that, you know, are on each floor. I mean, if we're at a point where we have to scramble and we don't, again, have the staff we need, I, I think that we're going to need to get creative with, with some sort of a, a college-type setting, you know, basically to prepare these kids. And, cause we that's, are. That's, yeah, I mean. Looking at dual enrollment, we've been working with people to try to bring some online courses. Ultimately, we put kids in a space. We have to give them the technology to take the courses, and we have to have somebody supervise them. We are looking yeah. at those opportunities also, uh, looking at trying to, for seniors, for example, trying to figure out if we can get them, if they're working, a work-study opportunity. Um, and so as we're looking at things, we certainly are trying to figure out some solutions to things. Ultimately. All I need to know is how many people I have, and then we can start solving problems. Okay. okay. So, I mean, that hopefully is something that perhaps can fit, you know, where we are currently at, you know, in order to yeah. bridge the gap, you know, and it resolve and it solves two problems, you know, uh, you know, the you know, non-optimal number, and you know, making sure these kids understand what they're going to be exposed to next year, if, you know, when they're in the senior year, naturally. Yeah. So okay. If I could follow up, to quick follow, and then I'll get right to you, Mr. D'Agostino. So I feel like I'm turning into my father sometimes, but when I went to school, um, seniors, if you had your credits to graduate, you could just take two or three classes that you needed and leave school early for a part-time job. So is there a scenario where perhaps if it's a six period day, seniors that are on track to graduate, not in any danger of not graduating, could attend the first four periods and leave after fourth period to go work at a job? That's why we would, I just said we're trying, gonna have to look at, for those kids, opportunities to do work study. Because we also have the mandate of the Department of Education of 990 hours right. and seniors fulfilling 168 academic days of full days. And so um, right. we have to make sure that it's organized so and have to get credit done for in the a way. Work study so it counts as, as part of the curriculum. Right. I, I would certainly like to see explore that a little bit more just because I think just like with our summer programs I mean I think there's a lot of value to that I think uh, you can't really teach job readiness in the classroom I mean you can teach the theory but it's another thing to go show up for work every day um, so that might be an option that would help us a little um, I've got some thoughts I'd like to share with the committee but I'll, I'll let I'll, Mr. D'Agostino is waiting his turn thank you I'll be quick um, when Mr. Minicello asked about priorities, you had mentioned the two language teachers. Uh, you also mentioned math and science, but was there a number for math and science, a number of teachers needed? Uh, there are two math teachers who were not recalled and one science teacher. All right. And then the English and social science, um, was there any idea of the number of teachers you're looking for there? Uh, for social science, in order for us to continue to be able to offer the electives that we offer and to, to meet some of those needs, we, we would have to have at least three of them back. Okay. And ultimately, that's, that's the balance. It's once we figure out how many we have, uh, in English there were four teachers gone. In order for us to create electives to move some of those kids, and a lot of the kids who don't have classes are not the juniors and seniors, they're the freshmen and the sophomores. Right. And so to create elective opportunities for them, especially in a content area where they have to do state testing, could only benefit them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in the English department as well, to be able to bring some of those people back that would bring elective opportunities to us. And if we knew that it was going to be a certain number of people, we could say we target the electives for the younger grades and we look at how to move the seniors out of the building and reschedule them so that either they're in the morning they're there or the afternoon, but we reschedule them with the expectation that 
we have to help them have opportunities to be employed somewhere or at least to be able to count it in some way. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and then I just want to make sure I'm clear on the, the numbers. The uh, reduction in force for 2015 put you down four classroom teachers, uh, if I heard you or understood you correctly, uh, with the proposed or the, the, the cuts for this year, how many would you again be down? How many would I be down from both years? No, just this coming year. This coming year, there were 18 p positions that were um, talked about last week. I think two of them were guidance positions. And so um, that would be 16 positions. So 16 instructional positions. OK. Um, I think that's it. Thank you. Um, Another follow-up question. So looking at electives for ninth and 10th graders, can MCAS prep be an elective for ninth and 10th graders? Of course, yes. We could create, and I think when we had a grant, which we're not getting either at this point that we're aware of, uh, we did MCAS prep courses and pulled sophomores who, when we looked at their scores in eighth grade, gave them that as an additional course. Uh, that grant thus far, we have not seen that the state is giving that particular grant. So to be able to create that kind of an elective for kids would be something we'd be able to do. Okay. Mr. Minichella. Follow up on that. What about uh, SAT prep? If we incorporated or were able to get some sort of a grant for SAT prep for seniors as, as a, an option? Uh, juniors. Yeah, I'm sorry, juniors and seniors. Yeah, actually, you're right, it's probably juniors. 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 Uh, the junior English course, as part of this new schedule, the requirement was that junior English be extended to a full year, and part of the, part of the work that they'll do with juniors is in SAT prep. Okay, so that would be incorporated into the into curriculum, the junior not, class into, curriculum, not a English curriculum. Yes. And do you think that that would be as effective as opposed to, you know, I um, I mean, when I went, it was like I think it was Kaplan's did the SAT review, but um, I think what would be helpful is that the kids would be in the class with their teacher every day for a year, and that was one of the areas of weakness that people complained about, and colleges questions us on regularly was that. Uh, our junior class was a semester rather than a full year. And going to the full year would then give them an opportunity to cover that curriculum that we've covered all along and then add that, that prep in. We do for juniors PSAT testing in October. So those results could then be used in classes to really work to target skills. Uh, in terms of grants, I know Save Our Sports supports people in the afternoon doing yeah. uh, SAT prep, and they've opened it up beyond athletes for kids to be able to take that. And that, that I guess that would be something that I think might fit well with sort of a seminar type of a opportunity. Like if, 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 if a private uh, entity sponsored an SAT or a PSAT prep, um, I mean, that to me would be ideal for you know, dealing with a large number of students on one, you know, at, at uh, in one classroom setting. You know, to, so it's not sort of a, it's, you know, it's not chemistry, it's not, uh, you know, it's not uh, algebra too, it's, it's not, um, you know, physics, um, where you'd want to have, a, you know, a, the smallest class sizes to, um, you know, learn the material. Um, I don't know, it's just, just a suggestion, just sort of talking out loud, basically. Anyone else with uh, questions for Principal Walter? Okay. Thank you, Principal. Thank we'll you. Have some further discussion. So, if I could take a minute just to kind of get back to a big picture thing, because I wasn't at the last finance meeting, and just to try to share some insight with the committee looking at the whole budget. Um, I appreciate everything Principal Walter just said. And, and the need for some additional instructors at the high school. Um, I'm not comfortable with the 18 number right yet. I think we still got some work to do and we're coming back in two weeks. Um, but I, some of my concerns are around things like um, if we're restoring positions at the high school, I think we've got some obligation to restore a couple of positions at the alternative program. 
it was 13 positions eliminated over at a very small alternative school last year, or two schools that were combined into one. I think we have an obligation to consider restoring some instruction positions over there. Um, I know Ms. Barry's coming up in a minute, but I'm concerned about middle school class sizes and elementary school class sizes and where the specific needs are there. And uh, this is my seventh school budget. And I think one of the things I've learned over the previous six years is that somewhere around the middle of August, the administration's gonna come to us with some very specific needs that they identify when they get close to that first day of school. You know, we're gonna hear, hey, we need a fourth grade elementary teacher over there. We need another English teacher over here. My God, we need someone, you know, there, there are gonna be some very specific holes to plug as we get closer to the first day of school and if we've already committed all the available funds, how are we going to address those critical needs as we come down to the wire? So I would really encourage the committee to leave a little flexibility and room and to still be a little conservative. And let's do some more work over the next two weeks. We're coming back in two weeks. It's only August 2nd. Still, still time to bring more positions back next time. Um, so I, I'm going to suggest that may be um, restoring 10 positions to the high school and a couple over to the alternative school would be a little more conservative step right now um, because I want to put a couple other specific needs on the table. And in terms of where you're at on money, in terms of available budget funds right now, you've basically spent it down in terms of the suggestions at the last finance meeting other than the anticipated $600,000 of additional Chapter 70 money. Um, I think we need to come back in two weeks with a hard look at transportation because I think you're four or $500,000 short on transportation and there is not going to be any more money other than whatever that additional Chapter 70 is. Um, you know, we did things a little different this year and I came up with everything I could possibly come up with early on so you could not have to make crisis decisions and we hope that there'd be some more money coming and there is some more money coming, but $600,000 is not a lot of money and particularly if you have to spend 400,000 on it making up a shortfall on transportation. Because I do know from my six previous budgets, the parents do care about transportation also. It's important to a lot of families. Um, I also would like to suggest tonight a, a, a couple other things I'd like you to look at. I'd like you to look at, I guess I'm asking that you would look at a couple of um, mid-level administrative positions that really have a dramatic impact on students. Um, and I know that philosophically there's a reluctance to restore administrative positions. I get that. Said it myself during many budgets. Um, However, there's a couple positions, um, and specifically the assistant principal at the Goddard School who's working with our EI kids uh, that does critical work and also runs the EI program over at the Keith Center. We're getting a lot of bang for the buck there. What I'm concerned about with these two positions are our most vulnerable students, the students that need more help than the average student. We can't forget about them. And so I don't know how in good conscience we eliminate the assistant principal at the Goddard uh, that's working with all these EI kids and I don't see anyone else that's gonna pick up that work. And I also don't know how we get by without a um, K through eight department head for guidance services. We've got 50 or 52 or something elementary and middle school guidance counselors and adjustment counselors. Who in the world is supervising all those counselors now? Because I'm asking that question and nobody seems to have an answer. Not to mention a dozen so interns that'll be coming in. Think about who these adjustment counselors and guidance counselors in, in, in this particular position. This is the office that's, that's dealing with DCF, that's dealing with traumatized kids that's dealing with kids that have witnessed violence, that are dealing with homeless kids. I mean, these are the most vulnerable kids. So I mean, I, I think these two positions, in that particular position is a red-circled administrator. 
It only costs 45 grand to bring that job back because we're still paying that person that's in that job now their salary. They're bumping out an entry level adjustment counselor. That's 45 grand. So to me, for 45 grand, I don't want to get by without that position. I think we get a lot of bang for the buck. That person's also doing work over at the Champion Program. Um, and I don't want to forget about the alternative kids. So I would like you to consider restoring those two positions. The K through eight guidance and adjustment department head is 45,000. That assistant principal position for the guard is like 97. I just, in good conscience, can't live without it. Um, and then we've got to talk about police. Because I will tell you that your parents are also concerned about safety and security in the schools. And right now, there are, let's put it this way, two years ago you had 10 school police officers. Today you've got eight, and on August 1st you're going to have six because two of them have been hired by the Brockton Police Department effective August 1st. Um, the administration has worked very aggressively on recruiting and hiring three replacement school police officers and I checked with the chief today and they're not quite done with the selection process but it's getting close. But the reality is that if everything goes perfectly, those replacement officers are going to go in you won't see them coming into the schools till next June at the earliest because they'll go off to the academy in October. The academy is six months and then there's two months of in-house training after that. So it'll be eight months before those officers are out working on their own independently. Lieutenant Mill, uh, am I close on that? Yes, you are. Okay. So the reality is, as of right now, coming into the school year, you're down to six school police officers. Um, for the upcoming year, it, clearly not enough. In the meantime, because of budget issues I've had in the police department, I have reass I've asked the chief, I haven't done anything, asked the chief to reassign the two school resource officers that are actively working and put them back out on patrol for the summer. We desperately need the patrol officers. Um, I'd like to get SROs back into the middle schools because I think particularly in light of the short staff on the school police for the upcoming year, we need them more than ever. Um, now historically, prior to two budgets ago, the cost of the, of the school resource officers was split between the, the school side and the city side. And the, the split was 60-40. Now when I ask Aldo, he says the city paid 60%. When I ask Jay Condon, he says the schools paid 60%. Uh, so I'm not sure which way the 60-40 really went, but I think 50-50 would be a lot easier. Um, and so, yeah, <laughs> I'm suggesting 50-50, Tom. I think that right in the past school year, we had three school resource offices. Previously, a couple of years back, we had four. There was a reduction from four to three. I'd like to suggest for your consideration that if you were willing to fund 50%, we could go back to putting four school resource officers back into the middle schools. I think that would take some of the burden off of school police that could focus more on the high school and the elementary schools. Um, your total number of officers is still down one or two positions from what you had this past year. You will have some savings, not a ton, but you will have some savings in the school police payroll because if they don't go to the academy till October, you'll have saved about three months of payroll on three officers. So it probably comes close to roughly one full-time salary. Um, and I think a ballpark number is 150,000 out of the school budget and 150,000 out of the city budget um, to fund four. If you want to leave it at three, we can split that 50-50. But I think we really have to take a hard look at what our police staffing is in terms of police assigned to the schools between school police and SROs for the upcoming year. Because I will tell you, I am sure Parents are concerned about safety and security in the schools and on the campuses. 20, how many campuses do we have? 23? 23 campuses? Six officers to cover 23 campuses? 
at least with four SROs, there'd be 10. And I also think we've got, in terms of the three SROs we had last year, I think we've got three great SROs who really get high marks from both principals and parents. And I think we need to get them back. And I'd love to add one more back to get it back to where it used to be. So I think that if we could look at 12 teaching positions right now at this point in time, pending further consideration in two weeks, we asked Principal Wolder to come back and show us what it looks like with what you would recall for 10. If you could call back 10 today, update that for us and show us what that looks like and give us an updated impact. Um, I defer to the administration. I, I don't want to micromanage, but I, I know we could use a couple more people at the alternative programs. And, and the total cost to bring back those two mid-level administrators that work directly with a lot of at-risk kids is about $140,000 for those positions. In the SROs, if we went to four, is about 150. You'd actually still be committing less money than you were talking about committing the other night by a little bit. And it's open to discussion, but I just think I don't want to see us get to the point where we don't have much left for resources between now and the first day of school. Transportation eats up most of what's left. And I, I just know the administration's going to come back in August when, with some specific needs they're going to have. And I think you've got to keep a little money in the kitty till a little bit later in the ball game so that critical needs can be addressed. So that's, that's my spiel. Discussion? Mark, then Tom. If, if, if I understood right, I mean, it sounded like, um, at least at the high school there, there are eight pretty vital positions needed. And then I'm also concerned about the two guidance positions that were eliminated with the, the, the students that we just heard from at the beginning of the meeting. Um, you know, one of the things that jumped out that one of them commented on is, is that there is a need for, um, you know, guidance to help them with some of the issues that they're, that they're dealing with. Um, so I, uh, that's something that kind of has jumped out at me as well. So I, I mean, I, I think, again, there were eight positions identified that were pretty vital. And, and, and just my own opinion that maybe, you know, the two guidance positions deserve some um, so you're still you're still talking around 10. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'd like a chance to see what this model would look like with 10 positions restored. Right. Um. Think. Yeah. OK. Mr. Manchel? A lot of the points you made are certainly valid points and important points. So um, um, with respect to the, the teaching positions at the high school, Principal Walter definitely needs to have tonight um, a vote by the body in terms of being able to set up a schedule. So you know, we have to come to an, um, a conclusion of you know, what is uh, going to be allocated so that she can come up with a plan. Um, but then I guess if you ask me that track of a question, in my opinion, we can't afford any more than 10. Well, I, I yeah. think that Mr. D'Agostino pointed out that, you know, at this point, 10 would seem to be a good number. Um, and then we'll see what it looks like. And if it's impossible to go I forward mean, with that, then, then we look at it again. And we've got to consider this, you know, this middle school thing is still problematic. Um, you know, we've never had a charter school with middle school students start up in the city before. So, I mean, I know the 150 number or wherever we're at, but depending exactly where they're coming from doesn't mean we necessarily need any less staff than we had last year. What if it's one here, one here, one there? And completely anecdotal, but coming into this budget, if I had to give you a level that I was most concerned about class size, and, and Ms. Barry will hear from you in a second, but it was middle schools. Because middle schools is where, when I'm out visiting schools, it's where I ran into some really big classes at times. Um, 
So I know it's not scientific, and they may tell me the numbers are all wrong, but my personal concern coming into this budget was I saw some big classes at the middle school level last year. At the other levels, it wasn't consistent. There was an occasional class that seemed like too many, but there was other classes that seemed like they could have taken a few more. Um, so I think we've got to give the administration a little more time to wrap their hands around what exactly really the impact is at the middle schools and what the needs are. I don't want to end up with no money to hire some middle school teachers back. Those are the critical years. I mean, man, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, to me, those are the most important years, and we haven't even talked about where we are at staffing on the middle schools. So, uh, you know, I'm not in, I'm, I don't disagree with, you know, the number of 10 at this point, um, but there are a lot of other issues that, at the next finance subcommittee meeting that we have to deal with. Right. We've eliminated intramurals right now across right. the board. We've eliminated middle school sports across right. the board. So, you know, in terms of the staffing, I get the staffing, but you, you and I both know how many parents and kids yeah. and, you know, were upset about eliminating those types of programs. So that's something else we need to consider. You know, I, I had this conversation next. with Mr. Gormley yesterday. I mean, uh, something else I learned in six previous school budgets, parents that want those after school sports programs, particularly in the middle schools, doesn't mean we can't do it a little differently. Right, exactly. Um, but, 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 but I think there's a need for it. Right. And, but, and know, I think parents want it. And we need to save some money just in case. Yeah, I mean, what you said is true about the middle school years. And, and you know, if the kids don't have anything to do after school in the middle school years, we all know those are the years that really direct a, a student or a child in the direction that they're going to go in, either good, bad, or right. indifferent. I really so, think they're the so, years. so I hear what you're saying about um, backing off a little bit on the 18 number. Um, with respect to all the other issues in terms of the other positions, um, we need to put it all, obviously, all on the agenda for the uh, meeting in August, the first week of August. So, you know, I, I've, I told the, the committee at the last finance committee meeting, there's still a lot of work to be done. Absolutely. You know, we have, you know, we don't have the commitment yet, you know, of, of that $618,000. I mean, un until I see it, I'm not going to believe it, you know. So um, we do need to be cautious. So um, and, and I do believe it's there, but I agree. I think two weeks from now, we're in a much stronger position. Yeah, and and, and we do need to grapple with transportation. That was right. brought out. I, you know, I mentioned that at the last finance subcommittee. It absolutely. We got to deal with transportation as well. Um, you know, we don't need a repeat of kids getting, you know, in horrible accidents. You know, like we've had in the past. Um, so. Um, so I hear you. Um, the you know we we decided at the last meeting at the finance meeting on 18 positions. It doesn't mean that we can't tailor it back a little bit. Um, uh, so okay, and, and then we'll put those other items on discussion for How would the um, finance. We still do to hear from Miss Barry, so maybe we should yeah. hear from Miss Barry on middle school and elementary, and then we could. Then consider yeah, taking some sure. votes. Then, I go ahead, Mark. One additional question: You mentioned that um, we have 52 uh, K through 8 guidance counselors. It might be. I'm sorry, Sal. What's the number? 50. It's around 50. Total total number of guidance and adjustment counselors K through 8. 53. Fif there are, okay. There are 34, uh, 34 school adjustment counselors, 10 guidance counselors, nine psychologists. The psychologist, I'm sorry, that's what I was forgetting. So there are okay. 53 professional staff mm -hmm. that are supervised by that. They're supervised by that one position. Okay. And it costs 45 grand to bring, put that person back in that job. Okay. Um, I'm wondering, and, and Deputy Superintendent Thomas, I hate to put you on the spot, but the Superintendent's not here to, to ask. Has there been any discussion about that exact problem. How will those people be supervised? Do we have? Has that been talked about? Is there any kind of? Uh, we've talked about it that it would be picked up some by executive directors, and a lot would be put on the principals at the individual schools where they where they work. Okay. And and who some already have between 50 and 80 people to evaluate as far as principals go. Right. Um, but it would also from the from the central side, it would be picked up by an executive director. Okay, and the person who was formerly in that position 
did they have a, a background in you know, that field that made it more appropriate for them to supervise these folks? Yeah, the, uh, certified in both adjustment and guidance. Okay, thank you. And I, Mr. D'Agostino just reminded me of something I, I, I meant to preface my remarks with. Um, the suggestions that I'm putting on the table for consideration tonight, I, I did spend a good amount of time on the phone with the superintendent this afternoon, and she's 100% on board with all of these. So I, I spent some time vetting them out with the superintendent before I brought them up to you guys tonight. So because she's not here, I thought it was important that I mention that we had that conversation today. And she supports all of these recommendations. And just to update on the numbers, um, I was just going over the minutes from the, uh, the Monday's finance subcommittee. And, and correct me if I, I'm wrong, I wasn't there. But you were working with about 978,000. Mm -hmm. um, the 371,868 that you were carried over from the June 21st meeting, 371,868. Then um, there was additional cuts in money found in um, line, line items for school, uh, middle school sports, which was transportation, that was 92,000. We found out from special ed we'll be getting another 315,806 for circuit breaker funding, and then the superintendent, and we worked together to take 200,000 out of the substitute budget, which brought it to 978. So um, when you were talking about 12 teachers, um, that's about 300,000, that, that, that would be 12 teachers. If you do 10, obviously it'd be 250. Aldo uses um, that 25,000 because Aldo, you're pulling yeah. people off of um, overtime. So basically you, um, with the 978, if you bring back 12 teachers, you're taking 300,000 away from that. Um, if you do the 10, you'd be obviously 250 and you'd still be working with 728,000. And again, this is not taken into consideration any, any that 617,000 that's supposed to be coming from the state. So it's basically just an update on, and if I'm wrong on that, someone correct me, please. Yeah. I, I think when Aldo talks about the net cost, he also factors in the savings on the unemployment. Um, so that's, that's definitely a factor too. Call the person back. He's already built the unemployment expense into the budget. That unemployment expense goes towards covering the salary when you bring the person back. And I agree, but I'd like to hear from Ms. Barry. Oh, yeah, and then, so how about if we, if we hear from Deputy Superintendent Barry and then take a couple votes after that? Fair enough? Yeah. You're just yeah. freezing in here, Mr. Thomas. Very cold. It's very relaxing in here. Thank you. I, I enjoy it. <laughs> My time here. Uh, we have a very quick presentation, um, and what will probably happen is after giving you this presentation, you might have questions, um, which will allow us to think about some of the things that we might want to put in the Friday packet or some additional information that you might want to get after this evening. But we will be brief. Um, the purpose really right now is to provide additional information um, to illustrate our full, oh boy. <laughs> this, is, this is what happens when you go late. Oh, okay. Um, so you actually have it in front of you. Cheryl, you think it's worth it to even turn this on? Okay. Um, you have this in handout form. I'll, I'll just kind of move over. Yeah. Um, so, here we go. It was all set up for us. Um, so what we'll do is we'll give you a brief overview of our full complement of needs um, so that you have an idea of what we're talking about, uh, K to 8, in addition to what was um, referenced at Brockton High. Um, we're going to start with the middle school level. Um, in the first slide, when we get to it, we are actually saying that there is a need for 11 additional positions at the middle school level. We have them divided by content, um, four English language arts positions, 
four foreign language positions, one humanities position, and one, uh, two social studies positions. And in reference to Mayor Carpenter's question, um, the foreign language at the middle school level, we have Spanish, Latin, and we have Chinese, um, but not at all of them. It's a variation depending on which school, which location. Um, so um, one of the things that Mayor Carpenter said was that um, we already had large class size at the middle school level this year. So um, one of the things that the middle schools are struggling with is um, the real need for additional positions because they're anticipating large class sizes um, and um, also more study periods. Excuse me. Do you want to speak to that? And we'll kind of go from there. I don't want to touch the computer. Okay. <laughs> Um, and the principals have been working with Dr. Murray in thinking about, you know, how to be really creative with scheduling, um, but there is a real need for those 11 positions in order to fully schedule the schools in, in the way that they need to be scheduled. Uh, one of the questions uh, asked was how many students typically take a foreign language in, in the middle school, and basically it's approximately 100 students uh, per per grade. So you'll have, in one building you may have Latin and Spanish, another building may have Spanish and Chinese, but you can assume that it's about 100 students, um, not all at once obviously, but over the course of the day um, involved in foreign language. If you eliminate that, then obviously once again you have uh, four periods a day that you have approximately uh, 50 students that you need to find some type of activity uh, for them to do. Um, the recommended or requested number of uh, positions 11 is taking into account that uh, every one of the buildings are cre getting creative in terms of trying to develop schedules that will allow for loss of staff. Uh, in many cases we've discussed um, ideas where we would try to create some kind of uh, and I'm reluctant to say directed academics, but an activity especially for our incoming sixth graders where we might have a one or two days of cycle where they would actually get extra help with homework, organizational skills, and kind of that transition which we find to be quite challenging for sixth graders. Um, the additional reductions in staff would then kind of have a cascade effect where classes again in the seventh and eighth grade would be impacted in terms of their availability as we would have teachers teaching uh, multiple levels and do really to contractual obligations we can only have them teach so many so many classes each day so we're in the process of doing that um, everybody had kind of different needs again at our level the changes in staffing had a lot to do with seniority and so there are some buildings that were hit a little more dramatically in one one area say English language arts or mathematics as opposed to another but uh, with the seven middle school programs, uh, my six colleagues and myself feel that with 11 additional positions, we would be able to put a product out that would not only meet the needs and challenges of all our students, but one that the city of Brockton would be proud of. So. Okay, we'll just move on to elementary. Um, so um, when we have a teaching uh, shortage at the elementary level, it shows up differently, obviously. Um, and one of the things that you see is we have the ability to actually work with class size when we roll numbers over from one grade level to the next. These numbers are as current as yesterday. Um, and where you see red, that is where um, we have frozen or capped classes. What you see there on that slide is that grade five, before the school year even starts, presents a problem in multiple zones. The reason why we're focusing on zones tonight is because when new students are enrolled in the Brockton Public Schools, um, our policy states that they um, are eligible to um, be offered a seat in the zone in which they reside. So thinking about zones as opposed to isolated uh, classrooms where class size might be big is probably the best way to illustrate what our needs might be. Grade five is of particular concern because as you can see, um, citywide at the R known, we're already capped at 29 and 30. Um, and at the, in the northwest zone, we already have really high numbers. And, and in the south zone, um, we do not currently have available seats. So one of the things that would happen with um, incoming grade five students was the school registration center 
center would obviously, um, if stu new students moved into the Northwest zone, um, they would be offered a seat at the George or the Raymond because that's currently where we have seats. But we eventually anticipate running out of seats in the Northwest zone. We don't have seats in the South zone and we don't have seats in the citywide zone. So one of the recommendations that we would make is that um, we would suggest adding a grade five in the citywide zone because that would help the Northwest zone as well as the South zone and adding another grade five class in the Northwest zone to address what we know will be overcrowding in grade five in those multiple zones. So we're, we're suggesting two positions for grade, oh, this turned off. I won't take it personally, but my mic is off. Can you still hear me? You um, can use mine. Oh, thanks. Um, so we're suggesting adding, um, adding a grade five class in the Northwest zone and adding a grade five class in the citywide zone in order to anticipate what we see as a, a, a concern in multiple zones for grade five. Uh, another issue is in the Northwest zone again. Um, currently, we do not have seats in grade four in the Northwest zone. So if a new student were to move in, we do not have seats to offer uh, that student. And uh, the South zone is already showing to be pretty problematic. Um, if we had new students um, coming in in grade one in the South zone, we would obviously offer them a seat at the Huntington School because our numbers show us that we don't really have seats at the Davis and Kennedy. And when you think about how busy and active grade one students are, the idea that we actually have classes with 28 and 29 kids in them is, is somewhat disheartening. So one of, um, we have the 11 positions that we are suggesting um, a need for at the um, middle school level. And because of the crowding within specific zones, we are suggesting that we need four additional elementary positions to address this overcrowding. So it's a total of 15 positions, 11 and 4. And just um, in the interest of you having additional information and numbers, when we think about instructional positions at the elementary level, um, if we were to move ahead and add four, four additional instructional positions, um, we made 14 cuts originally, um, and we're requesting four back. So 10, there would still be 10 positions out at the elementary level. Um, and nine cuts would remain at the middle school level if we were to actually get back 11. So we just did that very quickly. Um, anticipate questions and also some suggestions about additional information that we can provide to you um, for the Friday packet so that you have the information that you need in order to begin to think about some of these things as well. I have a question about the, with the bumping and everything. If we do restore 10 positions back to the high school, um, the foreign language piece is going to be very fluid, I guess you would say, because you had people possibly going back and forth. If those two positions were restored, um, what would be the overall effect of the middle school? Um, we would actually still need the four additional foreign language okay. positions. So we would need the two at Brockton High. Yep. There is some sharing. There is some folks who are itinerant who go between locations. But typically, that happens more at the middle school level. Mm -hmm. So if the high school got two, we would still need the four in order to provide a full complement of uh, languages at our schools. One of the things that we really don't want to do is if we've offered a language at one of our middle schools, we want to continue to offer that language. Right. Um, and you know, limiting those opportunities, um, the same concerns that exist at the high school level, we have those same concerns at the middle school level. So we would still need to move ahead with the additional four, unfortunately. Okay. Um, just like when we were looking at this with the high school, we identified that while 18 would be preferred and certainly beneficial, that there were eight that, were, that seemed to be absolutely vital. Um, you're looking for 11 at the middle school level. Um, is there a lower number than that that you can say are, are vital? Um, I, I know obviously 11 would be ideal, but. Right. Um, 
you know, foreign language, we spoke to that a little bit. I think if we were to limit the number, that would come back. Um, I think what we're doing is we're creating a space where there are some opportunities in some schools, but not others. Um, and perhaps the language opportunity existed in a school that may no longer exist. So that would be, I think we would want to think about that a little bit. Um, and because the other positions are content positions um, as well, um, core instructional positions, it's, it's really hard to prioritize that list. I don't know, what do you think, Dr. Murray? Uh, initially, when we, we started, when we uh, started this, I asked for priorities from, from all of the uh, middle school principals. And uh, fortunately, we were able, uh, through the return of those 34 positions, to actually address, in most cases, that first priority. But in virtually every building, you have two or three uh, subjects that we fully expect not to be filled. And so we are planning accordingly. And our last conversation um, this week was, again, what do you need? We kind of prioritize those things. We had a meeting yesterday. We whittled them down again. And uh, I think we're pretty much at that bare bones point. Uh, we didn't do it by school because, again, with the bumping and seniority issues, uh, some of the schools had uh, larger numbers. And as a consequence, had some more people come back out of that 34. Um, I know as a principal, you know, when, it, when we leave here or August 2nd, I'm going to be given my staff and then uh, just like uh, Principal Walder, we're going to make it work. But I, I think uh, these folks have kind of whittled things down. We're trying to get creative with, um, you know, uh, half year type courses or half programs uh, and ways to utilize some of our uh, specialists uh, in terms of um, ways that we can cover you know parts of these these programs but I think it's pretty much we've already given up so in most cases at least one uh, in some cases two uh, positions and again from my own personal uh, perspective I lost three positions last year that that we didn't get back so it's kind of a cumulative effect you know you, you do what you have to do it's no one's fault but then um, you out on top of that you know I have three more people that wouldn't be returning right. and it, it gets to the kind of the critical mass where you just don't have any place to go so 11 is pretty much the the vital number is what you're telling me for that's, seven that's programs your... that's that's for everyone and I think everybody would be uh, comfortable as I said you know not only providing uh, an education but the, the kind of quality that we're looking for here in Brockton so What would you say at West, without these people returning, what would be your largest class? Like what's a, what's a yeah, Most number? of my classes will be between 28 and 30. Uh, that would be especially uh, true. We have a very large incoming sixth grade. I think it's 247 students, even with the impact from the charter school. Uh, our seventh and eighth grades are a little smaller. But we, where you would run into the, the problems is for our common planning time and for that time during the day that is critical for teachers to talk about students and, and about academics. Uh, we would end up with much larger groups. For instance, if we did not have foreign language, we would end up with approximately 60 students in a location somewhere in the building, probably you know, being supervised by, by one adult. And um, even with the, re the request honored that I have, I, I would still have an additional time in my sixth grade. So, you know, the idea is as we cobble these schedules together is to make sure that we don't have, you know, a sixth graders in one day out of four in two studies or that we have eighth graders who, uh, through no fault of their own, suddenly now have, you know, uh, two academics where, the, where they don't have coverage. But it would probably be about 60. And I think that would be a fair number for pretty much all the schools. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else with questions for the deputy superintendent or the director? Tim. Just to either Dr. Murray or Liz Berry, the, uh, I know it's early with this charter school. I was told originally it was going to be 350 students. And we heard tonight this, uh, they have 170 at this point. Do you think that is going to make these class sizes smaller? Or? If that, 
It's sure. a child school goes to capacity. Well, so we're looking at our numbers. As I said, our sixth grade is, is pretty big, um, over 245, and we'll typically get a few more students before the uh, start of school. We have around 210 students in our eighth grade. So if you just divide that up for the core subjects, you're still going to have probably 26 or 27 students in each class. Uh, that to me is a very manageable number. I mean, the, the rooms are crowded. It's, it's not perhaps ideal. Uh, but I don't see that the students who have left our building to go to the charter school, the, that number is one of the higher numbers in the district as having a really big impact on the, the class size. The one or two students does make a big difference, don't get me wrong, but you're still going to see in some of our uh, non-leveled classes, you're still going to have you know, 29, 30, 31 students in, in one room and you know, 24, 25 in the other. The other half of the question is, do you think out of those 11 positions, because of the charter school, you may not need them all? I, again, I think my building. I know was, it's, we don't know yet. No, but I think in, in all candor, probably I have as many confirmed students going to the charter school as, as anyone. I also tend to have the largest gen ed population. I don't see it having an impact right now. Uh, their numbers aren't what they had purported to be. So if suddenly in the next uh, couple of weeks there was another 100 or 125 students and they all came from one part of the city, then, then there is a possibility, a strong possibility. But it, it doesn't appear as though that's going to be the, the case. But it, it, could, it could happen, but it hasn't yet. OK, thank you. Deputy Superintendent Thomas. And also um, for the August 2nd meeting, we will um, have updated numbers on the charter school. And I also will find the actual schools find out what schools these students are coming from, what middle schools they're coming from. Uh, for example, like on Friday the 15th, we received an email from Parent Information Center, um, and there was 157 students that had uh, parents that had filled out the release of records to go to the charter school. And then obviously today, Tuesday the um, 19th, we're up to 170. So we'll get these counts um, every week, and then we'll see what we have on uh, August 2nd, and I'll also bring an update on actually where those students are coming from, what schools, what middle schools they're coming from. So we have, we can look at that on Tuesday the 2nd. That would be helpful. Tom. Dr. Mark, so right now the numbers at the middle school still include those 170 kids or they exclude them? They would be, once we hand the uh, CUME folders over to Sir Dr. Barris at the parent registration, she actually gets the waiver, the signed release. At that time, they're removed from our role. So I would assume that that is a pretty up-to-date figure as far as the building principals are working with. And uh, ours is updated daily. So okay. I, in my case, I, I feel pretty confident that it's an accurate figure. So I'm sure everybody else is in the same, okay. same situation. I also think it's important to note in that number of students from the city of Brockton, it is not necessarily all students from the Brockton Public Schools, but it could be, and my understanding is it's about 40 students who may have attended Trinity or gone to Foxborough Charter or some other identity. So it doesn't make a huge difference, but out of that total, again, it's not all students from the Brockton Public Schools, but from Brockton. Yeah. As I was watching the presentation, I think just for the committee going forward after we get over the next six to eight weeks, um, <clears throat> I would suggest policy might, policy subcommittee might want to have some conversation around our policy of assigning new students that come into the system. Um, you know, one thing that's unique to gateway cities is we tend to have kids coming in year round. It's not just during the summer. and. I think we've got to give the administrators more flexibility to just if someone's coming in during the year and we've already set everything up, I don't know that we can offer the same kind of options that we offer to kids already in the system. And to me, it would not be unreasonable if a new, new student is coming into the system in the middle of the year that we look and say, we've got a seat for you at this school. And that's the end of the conversation. You know, we, that's where your seat is for this year. And next year you can, you know, have the same chance to go for a seat in any other school as anyone else. Because I think 
part of what we've got to do here is really maximize using every seat logically and every, that's available in every classroom and not have a 30 class here and a 23 class over here because everyone wants to go to this school. Well, if you just got here, and we've already got 28 in that class and we got 23 over here, you go here. That's where our seat is for you. Um, so I, I would ask maybe six to eight weeks out once we get through the first day of school that maybe policy would consider looking at that. And I think also once we get by the first day of school, as I'm looking at that, and we'll talk in a minute about the, the facilities master plan, and I appreciate most of the committee being at city council last night. Um, but I think immediately after the beginning of this school year is when we need to start really looking at facilities next year. Um, and I, you know, I, because no matter how much long range planning we've got to do, I think we ought to be doing some immediate one year planning looking at the next year coming up as I look at some of those different parts of the city that are really under strain. And so I mean, immediately in my head, I, I look at the Barrett Russell School, I look at the Gilmore School, and I wonder what really is their highest and best use. And I'm not being presumptuous enough to tell you what it is, but I think it ought to really get a hard look now when we're not under the gun of giving the administrators enough time to, to shuffle bodies around. Because I think that's got to be part of the solution for next year, a year out, is seeing can we use what we've got a little bit smarter. Um, but nonetheless, I think they're making a, I, I think that uh, with the information brought forward um, by Deputy Superintendent Barry and Dr. Murray, I think puts us in the position that I think we're even more hard pressed to send any more than 10 to the high school. Because we'll, clearly we need to hire some other teachers at the other levels. I could even live with eight at the high school, but up to you guys. Kind of on that, no, oh, sorry. Are we still asking questions of these guys or we haven't discussed? Does anyone else have any additional oh, questions for Deputy Superintendent Barry or Dr. Murray? Not that we can't shout over to them over there afterwards if we have one, but. All right, well, you guys get back, get comfortable. Go ahead, Mr. D'Agostino, you've got the floor. Thank you. Um, uh, on that topic, I mean, we've looked at the high school needs, now middle school and elementary, uh, you know, the, the messages. I mean, we've got 25 positions, it seems, the, the, the messages, it's pretty vital for those. If I add up everything we've talked tonight, about tonight, and we did, actually did it all, we're $140,000 over what we actually have. Um, which is kind of part of the, and, and I know there's the 618, but we've got the transportation issue to address too. So we're really, I, I kind of tend to agree with the mayor on the, on the eight because just doing everything we've talked about, we're, we're already over budget. Do these guys need a final decision tonight also in terms of, or can they wait till August 2nd? The high school is okay. what needs the. Uh, so we could. The urgency is the high school. We could take a vote on restoring high school positions tonight and then continue the conversation on the middle and elementary. Because your point's well taken. I think we're okay and I think we can do it, but it's close enough. We really need to know what the numbers are on transportation, I think. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't have a problem with deferring the conversation on the, the school resource officers. And the point I forgot to make with you on that about the 50, 50, 60, 40, Two budgets ago in a real bad school year budget, um, the school committee chose not to fund those positions their share at all. And on the city side, I picked up 100%. We picked up 100%. And we did it again last year. So for the past two budgets, the city side has picked up 100% of the cost of the three SROs. Um, what I'm telling you this year is I need to ask you to participate again because I've got a $440,000 reduction in police payroll by the city council. I tried to get some of it back last night and didn't go real well. So um, I, I just know that I haven't got the money to pay the 100%, but I'll, I'm willing to find the money for half if you guys find the money for half. So that's, but again, I think, I think that can go to August 2nd also. Um, those school police officers are going to get hired and sent to the academy whether we make a decision on this tonight or August 2nd, and the two SROs that are currently working are going to stay out on patrol until the 1st of September regardless. So that, that, that part can certainly go over. 
but I guess we are going to need a, a, a vote on high school positions. And I am going to ask the committee to bring back those two mid-level administrative positions. It's, it's 140 grand for two critical positions that impact at-risk kids. I, I just don't know how we don't do it. And the money's there. So we'll start. I'll entertain any motions on any of the things that are on the table. I guess high school is where we really have to address. Well, should we first go over the minutes of that finance? Sure. Go right ahead, Tom. And, and approve those minutes. And okay. Okay, well, so I think you need to move on the agenda, right, under uh, unfinished business. That's your next item. Yeah, I thought we were already on unfinished business. Yeah, we are. So okay. I'll recognize you for the report of the July 11th Finance Subcommittee meeting. All right, so the uh, Finance Subcommittee met on July 11th over at the Arnold School. We were updated with respect to the available funding. As discussed here tonight, um, the superintendent informed us that the 618 um, is anticipated uh, and that uh, unfortunately we did lose some money, 486000 with regard to an expansion grant um, Kin of the kid at the kindergarten level. Uh, she also informed us that the $10 million pothole fund that uh, we had anticipated uh, is not being brought forth for the F FY17 budget. But um, Mr. Petronio informed us that there was some good news with regard to McKenny Vento, and there was $100,000 that um, was, uh, is going to be available to offset those costs. Um, as of June 21st, uh, at our school committee meeting, we had 371,868 available. Um, there's some additional, as discussed tonight, funding uh, from some savings of the transportation and middle school sports of 92,032. Um, some additional circuit breaker money, uh, 315,806, and uh, an adjustment with regard to the substitute teacher uh, line item of 200,000. Um, so, as uh, Mr. Thomas said, there's about $900,000 that we had to consider, and that does not include the 618. Um, we had discussion, and we spoke to Principal Walder about uh, the high school, and at the time, um, 18 teachers were uh, what was being requested. Um, we did request that uh, Principal Walder try to uh, adjust to a, a, a lower number uh, in anticipation of our needs at the other levels, which again we've discussed here tonight. Um, we also had um, a uh, discussion with respect to the scholarship um, program, and that is something that um, both the superintendent Principal Walder and Dr. Tarasi um, briefed us on, and it's a um, an addition, uh, an additional resource that, because of the change in the schedule, uh, the administration feels is necessary. Um, the good thing about that, also as was discussed, is that it provides another level of safety and security, um, accountability in terms of immediately letting us know who's uh, in the building. Uh, so that if there is an emergency, uh, attendance is not really an issue. Uh, the minute the person walks in the door and swipes the, uh, the card, they're accounted for, so to speak. So, um, so it kind of uh, deals with two issues. Um, we discussed uh, uh, the uh, issues that were presented earlier. Um, by the students and individuals that were concerned with the demerit system. And um, uh, we also had a um, discussion, a brief discussion about um, subcommittees where there was an adjustment made with uh, school committee member Plant and Diagostino. So uh, that basically is a summary of the minutes of that meeting. So 
Right, yeah, exactly. So uh, I would make a motion to just accept the report um, of the finance subcommittee meeting uh, that took place on July 11th, 2016. Could a motion on the floor? Properly seconded to accept the finance committee report. All in favor? Opposed? Okay, the report is accepted. So now I guess we could look at any specific yeah. actions the committee might want to take this evening. So uh, I think that I think that a lot of good points were made um, with respect to the you know the needs the overall needs of the system. Um, what I would recommend um, is that we consider adding uh, eight positions to the high school, but uh, I would also consider um, providing four more positions for a total of 12, uh, and those four positions could be uh, at the discretion of uh, the superintendent because we know that we're going to need those positions somewhere. It's going to either be the middle school or the elementary school, but um, so if we basically uh, allow or grant eight positions to be allocated to the high school um, and we allow four more positions for a total of 12 at the discretion of the superintendent. Uh, if Principal Mulder says there's absolutely no way I, I can do this with eight, I need one more or two more, the superintendent can, you know, with the discretion of the four we've given her, um, she can say, okay, I need to allocate two more to the high school or one more to the high school. And if she doesn't do that, then there's those positions are available to be uh, utilized at the middle or the elementary level. You know, we know we're going to need, it's obvious we're going to need more than that, but no this way we put 12 in the mix. We get 12 positions off of um, unemployment. Uh, that's so so I, I just think that makes sense because yeah. that way you can plug in a couple of uh, you know, holes if, if it's found that they exist at the high school or so, wherever. Tom, if I could just interject maybe a little twist on that. What if we did, um, I really think we've got a need to restore a couple of positions over at the alternative programs too, and I, I don't hear anyone advocating for them, but I, I know we cut a lot of positions over there, and I know we have an equal responsibility over there. So what if we did, along your suggestion, did eight for the high school guaranteed right now, two discretionary, because it seems a lot of our debate on the high school seems to be between eight and ten, seems to be where the conversation's going. And two, again, at the superintendent's discretion in the alternative program. Um, by that I mean at the Keith Center. Still adds up to 12, still keeps the superintendent's discretion in there. But it, I'm just not comfortable putting 10 or 12 positions at the high school and then saying, screw the kids in the alternative program, we're just throwing them away over there, we don't care about them. So, I mean, I think, I mean, do they, I'm not saying that's yeah, our intent, yeah, yeah. but I think that leads to that perception if we're adding positions every place else except with right, those guys if, too. If we give four discretionary positions, doesn't that do the same thing? No, because I, I, oh, okay. I, I think I want to earmark two, eight are earmarked for the high school, two are earmarked for the Keith Center, and two are wild cards as superintendent's discretion. So, if Principal Walter convinces the superintendent that she really needs the two more, they can just do it. They don't have to come back or wait till August 2nd. And then, you know, I agree with you. Clearly there's, there's a need for middle school and significant need for middle school and, and a few more elementary and, you know, we're gonna have to crunch the numbers a little bit on August 2nd. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I, um, I don't, you know, in theory disagree with that. I would just wanna, you know, phrase it that we give the superintendent the discretion because she may want to, um, she may want to um, get creative in terms of adjusting the roles or you know the the duties of those positions. Um, but I mean, so as long as you know, as long as you know, I, it doesn't bother me you know, allocating it, but in such a way that she's able to deal with uh, you know union type of issues or. You know, uh, duty. You know, types of yeah, duties of the of the individuals, and there may be some issues that need to be ironed out. I'm not sure. I mean, this is the first I've heard of this, obviously. Yeah, we'd have to look at the certifications of the people on the 
the riff list so, as well. Yeah, and so so we, okay. you know, it, so we can put so it in so motion. Long, I don't disagree with that. So long as there's so. there's flexibility that yep. adjustments can be made if they need to be made. You know, that's all. Miss Plant. I just like to say, um, you're right. We didn't discuss the alternative schools, um, and I think that's a matter of the squeaky wheels are getting the grease right now, um, and we we can't ignore that. But can we see something from the? I mean, that's what we have in front of us is what we're talking about. And what we don't have in front of us are numbers from the alternative schools. Okay. I so think that would just. So know. what about the eight and two, and continue the discussion on the two for the alternative programs to the August second meeting, and maybe we can get. I'll have Ms. Uh, Burns, Burns come in. We'll have bring Ms. Burns in to talk to us about what their needs are on August second. Does that sound fair? I'd like fair. to see that happen. Yeah. Tommy, you're going to be okay oh, with that. I'm fine with that. Um, I mean, it doesn't bother me to allocate 12 positions just so long, so long as I mean, we're going to need 12 positions. It's just a matter of where they're going. Yeah. You know, so you know, I don't want to be a, a, I don't want to be you know a hindrance to. So are you okay if all 12 go to the high school and we still have 15 more? Oh, being no, I'm asked not, no, 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 no. I'm not. I'm not fine with that okay. because. I'm not sure the high school needs 12 positions. No, I, I, you know, I so, seem to so, think our conversation was really bouncing between 8 and 10. Right. So that's what I'm saying is, you know, we allocate 8 to the high school. We allocate, um, uh, you know, four more positions uh, at the discretion of the superintendent and with in uh, a priority, I guess, or... Um, Okay. Uh, a commitment. That's right. A commitment, right. A commitment to a commitment to review the no. alternative school. You, you know what I mean? Right. That's all. all right. So you got me. No, you I'm just saying. Me. No. I'd Plus, it would give us some time to look at the the, the riff list and the certifications of the people that. I think as a committee, we got to identify needs, but sometimes we got to be careful we don't cross the line into I, I, operations. Yep. Again, I'm. I, I, yeah. Okay. I'm not trying to throw you know a wrench yeah. in, in in the no. wheel. So. But Eight guaranteed positions. Twelve guaranteed. Twelve eight guaranteed at the high school. But I was saying, you know, let me get the word out for the high okay. school. Yeah. Four positions, four more funded at the discretion of the superintendent to allocate towards either the high school or we could use them on August 2nd when yeah. they when with, we come with back to With a request to review um, the needs of the alternative school. You know, it's just sort of. It emphasizes no, I'm okay with bringing Ms. Burns in on August yep. 2nd and having a conversation with her about the alternative school. Okay. I don't know if this is possible, and I, I, I don't want to, I guess, add to the complexity of this, but is it possible to have a vote on the 8th for the high school um, because the, the, and, and then look at the um, issue of, of how many flexible positions, if you will, separately? Can that be done separately or is, there, or is there no point in really doing that? There's no point. Okay. I mean, it, 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 oh. It's a matter of we have four, we, four positions, additional positions to be, you know, al we're going to allocate them. The question is, you know, I think we just need I, to I, I think I, I get where you're going with the intent of Principal Walder on Friday convinces the superintendent that she just can't do it with less than 10. We want to empower the superintendent to just say go for it without having to come back to us again. Yeah. And, and that's a big two weeks because I know that the, the high school needs time to really look at that schedule and it would help them knowing that if she decides, if the superintendent decides to give two more positions to the high school, you know, next week or the end of this week, if they're approved by you, then they can get to work and, and start and, working on that schedule sooner. And I think the superintendent recognizes the the, the urgency of and needs of the other levels, the elementary and middle school. So exactly. I don't think that she's going to make a decision that is, um, you know, going to harm the other. No, you know, I'm okay with that uh, because you know. I think the part of, I had a conversation with the superintendent today too that, in preparation for the next finance meeting, I think that we'll try to get Aldo and Jay and myself and the superintendent all in the same room and see if we can maybe come with some consensus to the committee on some recommendations for consideration on, on August 2nd. 
try to drill it down a little bit more. Yeah, and also and maybe we can have some more a clearer picture of the transportation as well. Yeah, and when we, we got to get the clearer picture of the transportation. Yep, and we'll bring Miss Burns in to talk about the alternative program at the Keith Center. Okay, so I think you can keep it as simple as we're voting to fund uh, eight positions for the high school, recall eight positions for the high school and also funding four additional positions to be allocated at the discretion of the superintendent. Is that can it be that simple? Yeah, I think so. I mean, okay. I don't, I, I'm not making the motion. Why? Well, Mr. Jello can make it. <coughs> that was the original motion. Yeah. And then it got mucked up a little we bit. But took a long ways around but, to get yeah, back to well, where you we gotta, started. You gotta have open discussion and vetting it, so. So okay. you, did you second it? All right, so motion's made and properly seconded. Uh, restore eight instructional positions to the high school and also fund four additional recalls to be allocated at the discretion yeah. of the superintendent. Yeah. Teaching positions. Teaching positions. Yeah. And so then you would ask for further discussion. Any further discussion? Any further discussion? Or have we discussed this back to death, I think? Okay. All in favor? Opposed? Okay, so that's, that's adopted. Um, I would like someone to at least put out for consideration those two mid-level positions for department head of guidance K through eight and assistant principal at the Goddard School that I discussed earlier. Those will be the next one. I'm asking for a vote yeah. on them now, Tom. Oh, you want them now? Yeah. I want the commitment to fill those two positions. I shouldn't, I don't mean to say it that strongly. I'm asking the committee. I guess I might politely remind the committee that we have already over, we have already exceeded the city's requirement to fund education this year. So one of the options on the table for me on August 2nd is to put the 618,000 in the city stabilization account and tell you we're all done. For whatever that's worth, I'm asking for 140. Can I ask Ms. Plant. Right now, I'm sorry. Yeah, Ms. Um, Plant. Do you feel that the urgency with this is something that we cannot discuss on August 2nd? I just feel like we're getting so much information and we have so many needs that we do know we need to look at. Can this wait till the August 2nd? Or do you feel it's urgent that we Sal, need to go now? When do the interns come in, Sal? And, and is there any work to be done between now and there's, August? The scheduling needs to be done in terms of people giving their assignments. Um, it's, there's like 12, it's really a 12 month flow of work. And um, I think if, if you're asking me directly, um, I, can't, I can't overstate how important it is to restore that position. Not having that position is going to be extremely detrimental to the students of uh, And that's, uh, since you're asking me, yeah. uh, that's my No, I, I, I am asking. Strongest yeah. recommendation. And um, I, I think the position has to be restored so that we can begin to work with assigning uh, counselors as we, as we, you know, we call people to get, get scheduled straight for, for staff. What, what about the assistant principal position at the Goddard School? Because that comes under you also. Yeah, that is, that's also a vital position. Um, uh, Jay Lander had data that he shared with the superintendent in terms of uh, you know, numbers of exchange, uh, uh, outside placement things. We're, we're putting a new program over at Keith. That's going to need some supervision. And um, I think that both of those positions are vital. Um, you know, we mentioned the number of people at 53 staff being supervised by them. I'd like to add that those 53 staff are in 22 locations. So it's not like they're all in one location. That's, that's divided over 22 different sites, which range from elementary to middle schools to alternative schools to the early childhood centers of Kilmore and the Barrett Russell. Um, so it's a, it's a wide ranging job. Uh, working with TCF, 51 A's, uh, it's just, it, there's a constant, um, I mean, there are things happening now in our summer programs that need the attention of that person. And even though that person is not officially at work, would be dedicated to that kind of stuff. And is always available on call. So um, 
Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Mr. Gormley, then Mr. Sullivan, I'll work my way around. I'd like to make a motion to reinstate those positions and comment on the motion that I think our intent when asking for Central to be looked at was, or not Central, administration, I'm sorry, was to look at people who don't directly work with children. And uh, I think that these people do. Um, I know that the Goddard position, I've heard a lot of things about what an impact that made um, with those students. And having worked with that population a lot um, during my career, those students are our most vulnerable. And any change to their, um, any change to their routine and losing people uh, that are important in their educational life is more traumatic to them than it would be to a, stu a mainstream student. So um, I think that what I echo what Dr. Tarasi was saying. Okay, Mr. Sullivan. I was going to make the motion myself, but I would uh, second Mr. Gormley's motion. Okay, but we still we can still have discussion on the motion, Mr. D'Agostino. Um, in trying to make everybody happy, I guess I was wondering: is one of these positions? I have two questions. Is one is is one of these positions? You know, I, I know they're. I guess the, I, I I see that they're both vital, but is one a greater need to bring back now today versus waiting till August second over the other? Uh, and then I can my follow-up question: Obviously, you feel, uh, Mr. Mayor, very strongly about bringing them both back. Um, you always want to split the baby, Mr. D'Agostino. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to recognize Deputy S Superintendent Thomas. So looking at the, um, Dr. Moran, help me. When do the um, administrators return that work the two weeks and two weeks, August 18th? So what you could do is um, the guidance person does do some work over the summer with the interns and some of the summer school things. The guarded school um, assistant is not scheduled to return. They're both not scheduled to return until August 18th. So um, if you wanted to just do one now, I would recommend to do the guidance if you're going to put one back because that, does, that person does some things in the summer. The guarded assistant would obviously not start again until August 18th, two weeks before the school year. Those two positions are in the BEA contract. They work, um, they're 11 month, 11 month positions. They're two weeks be prior to the school year and two weeks at the end of the school year. So August 18th is the official start date for both of those people. Okay. But again, if you wanted to do just one, you could hold off on the guarded assistant because that person won't be back in the guarded school until August 18th. And I only brought that up because I know there were members of, I know Ms. Plant had pointed that out and maybe there were other members of the committee who, you know, would like to do what is, is vitally necessary but also have some more time to digest everything that's been presented to us tonight. So that, that's the only reason I was trying to split the baby. Again. Again. Ms. Plant. has been looking out for students that may have been overlooked otherwise. You brought up that we need to add funding to our alternative schools. You brought up two positions that affect our students that are most vulnerable. vulnerable. And I want to really commend you for that. And um, thinking about that, I would support um, your motion to bring back both positions. What you're asking of us this evening has been really to meet the needs of our students that need it the most. And, um, and I want to show support for that. Thank you. And I'm willing to defer the conversation on the COPS. I get that's one no one was really prepared for tonight. And I don't think the date, August 2nd, makes any difference. Nothing's going to change between now and August 2nd. All right, so um, there is, uh, there's a motion on the floor that's been properly seconded. So the motion, Mr. Gormley, why don't you just restate the motion because it's been a while. The motion was to reinstate the um, K-8 guidance department ed and the Goddard School Assistant Principal. Okay. And from the numbers I was given, the total cost of the two positions is $142,000. Yep, yep. Motion's been made and properly seconded. All in favor? Opposed? Approved. Um, 
Tom, is there anything else that requires action tonight? I think that we are going to have a full agenda at the next meeting, um, uh, the August meeting, uh, finance subcommittee meeting. So do all we these. Do we really need that 6:30 meeting that night? Um, do we really need the 6:30 meeting? The superintendent asked for that meeting. Uh, Wanda, is that ne really needed? The, the policy. policy? Do you need that meeting on the second? The, the policy meeting is because we've been informed by the Department of Education that there are two policies that need to be approved by the school committee. The, the easy thing is that we currently have both of those. We've updated some of the wording um, with our consultant from Mass, and um, it, it, should be the, it should be an easy thing just to approve those because we're required to have them approved prior to the beginning of the school year. And, um, the two policies on substance abuse. One is the prohibition of substance abuse, and the other is the fact that we teach about substance abuse in our health and wellness um, If we, um, can we do a 6.30 meeting before the August 16th a school committee meeting for that? Or is it the 16th, the next official school committee meeting? Here. So do we, then we can start finance at 6.30? I'm just thinking about what's a minute. I, I do think we're going to have a lot of stuff to work on on August 2nd. If we could get started at 6.30, we have a better chance of getting out at a reasonable time. So if, Dr. Rassi, you're fine with the? Okay. So we do the policy at 6.30 on August 16th prior to the regularly scheduled school committee meeting. And then we'll just do finance at 6.30 on August 2nd, Mr. Gorman. And for that policy meeting, I'd like to reiterate that you mentioned uh, capping, having a hard cap, and talking about that in the policy meeting um, for the incoming students who come in during the year. Yeah, I, I think that's that, it's good. It's, it's, it's a good topic, but I, I don't think it's that time sensitive. I think we no? can look at it after the first day of school. Okay. I think we really get some. And I think we, at the time when we do this, I, I think we have to revamp. We discussion. have to revamp okay. the whole policy, which saying. would help. Yeah. So maybe we should schedule. Policy. Maybe we should, we should schedule that. that. Yeah, I think we do for that for a whole, yeah, not without, exactly. not a, a separate meeting by itself. Yeah. yeah. So I think what we meeting. could probably say for the record tonight is that the committee has requested that the superintendent bring forward a proposed policy change for us to consider at a future policy subcommittee meeting. Does that work for everybody? Yeah. And that way we don't have to deal with it till we get done with the budget. It gives them a little time to put it together. Because the new policy really has to look at. Um, the transportation piece as well to mm -hmm. try to save some money in transportation for the following school year. Yeah, right. So it's it's going right. to take a few meetings. So yeah, for something to yeah. be so in place. Yeah. So we're on the record with tonight and asking the superintendent to bring forward proposals for our consideration at a future policy subcommittee. Okay. Yeah. Security subcommittee meeting. What do we want to wait until after the um, August? Uh, Finance subcommittee meeting and go from there. I guess the subcommittee could wait, but I guess we're, but we are asking the administration to show up on August 2nd with some hard numbers around transportation. Mike, just yes. to give you enough time oh, yeah. to do that. Yep. So is right. that fair enough, and Tom? Then, we're asking. Yeah, and then at that meeting, we'll just have to, we're going to have a bunch of meetings before the, uh, in August. Let's put it that way, which is fine, you know, but. Yep. So you don't think is just as part of finance, we can just look at the pressing budget. You think it's got to go to transportation, well, then come back. We might have to talk about bus routes and things like that. So could we do this on August second, get the numbers, then on August second schedule a transportation that would come up before August sixteenth? Yeah, if necessary. I mean, yes. Yeah. If if somehow okay. the funding is there to maintain right. so be another two current week schedule, window. but if there's a if there's a need yep. to tweak the current busing that is provided, then you're going to have to schedule another subcommittee specifically for that, which is tra transportation, safety, and security. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Okay. That's fair enough. I, we'd have a two-week window between the 2nd and the 16th to s get that meeting in if we had to. So we're supposed to take it easy a little bit during the summer. <laughs> okay. I think we've... So, in terms of we've covered everything for tonight. Um, does anyone have any new business they'd like to get on the table while we're all still here at 9.35? One quick compliment to um, public properties and um, 
uh, the school department personnel that are taking care of the pools. They are so, I'm going to say overused because it's been so hot, but um, they're doing a great job with what they have. Um, you know, the pools are clean despite, you know, the number of kids that are enjoying those pools. Um, and they're just really knocking themselves out. Um, no, you know, I, I appreciate you mentioning that. I agree too. And I know that last week with the heat wave at the end of last week, I think it was Thursday, Friday, Saturday, we extended the hours at the Cosgrove pool so it got even more use. And uh, the summer parks and playground program for the 7 to 12 year olds that you guys are helping to support with the Chartwell grant. Um, those kids are all being bussed over to the Manning pool two days a week. So all the kids going to the, to the playgrounds are getting two days a week at the pool with transportation and lunch provided. So it's, it's really, on the hot days, is pretty popular. We see the attendance higher on the pool days at the playgrounds. Sure. And the Cosgrove pool uh, needs some work, and they're maintaining that pool yeah. you know, at a high, a high standard with uh, it does. a facility that is... We're going to have to look at a some capital investment some TLC, you know, uh, It needs need some doing big their, money. They're darn to it does. maintain it. So. Yep, point well taken. Ms. Plant. Um, yes. Earlier this evening, I had a conversation with Mr. Bradley Souffrant that spoke before us, um, and he informed me that he wanted to do a presentation for the school committee. He had done some research about other policy, other ways of um, discipline other than the demerit system. And so I did tell him that I was going to ask the, of the school committee that we do invite so, him to do a presentation. Yeah. I, 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 my first, I'm open-minded to it, but I think it's more appropriate for policy, isn't it? Wouldn't that be more appropriate for it a is. policy yeah. subcommittee to yeah. be initial discussion? Which so I would. Full committee. We could refer that to. Yeah, because that's a that's a committee of the whole. So I mean, okay. he still gets all of us. So why don't why don't we refer that to policy? And uh, again, that next policy meeting is only 30 minutes, but maybe at a subsequent policy meeting from that. Okay. Is everyone okay with that? Also, I do believe that we do owe uh, Mr. Sfront an apology because the last time when he did come before us, this was uh, most of our first meetings. And Ms. as Mr. Chegg, Mr. Tagger pointed out, we were instructed not to um, respond, right. which we did not. But I do recall myself realizing that the next speaker was addressed. And I know I personally who was, who was, was the following. next speaker. I don't recall. I just know it was it was my first meeting. It was many of our first meetings, and so we all did as we were instructed. We didn't reply, but the second speaker did get um, acknowledgement, as Mr. Tagger had pointed out. And I do think that that did cause a little bit of a friction, um, which I think we do want to smooth over. We do want to be able to work with um, these young adults in our community and, and show them that we're listening to them and respecting them. I'm sure on our part it was innocent. Um, I think I'd have to see the tape and think yeah. about that one a little bit more. Because I mean, I, I think we, I mean, I, at the beginning of every meeting, I go through the rules for hearing of visitors, and we always do it exactly the same. Yes. So I mean, if someone, it could have been me, I don't know, I have to look at the tape, if someone made a comment inadvertently, I don't think that was to reflect adversely on anyone else that came in front of the committee. I by no means feel that it was done yeah. intentional, but I, once that was pointed out, I, I could understand that point yeah. of view. So. How about if we take that under advisement? Is everyone okay if we take that under advisement? It's a fair point. You raised it. We ought to take a look at it, but I think I'd like to know a little bit more about it. I'm at the age I, I don't remember the last meeting other than something happened months ago. Yep. But we will extend, so we have one, well, we'll get a, we'll, at the next policy meeting, we will schedule the date of a subsequent policy meeting. We'll invite them to the second one out. I think we've got to get through the budget, and then we'll deal with anything that's not budget related after the budget. We're really under the gun on the budget decisions right now. If everyone else is okay with that. That's good. Okay. Mr. Gormley. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, the students from the Summer Work and Learning who me and uh, Mr. Thomas visited at the Davis School. Um, Mr. Thomas and I had started a discussion that was triggered by uh, 
one of my constituents, uh, Tony Rodriguez in Ward 4, um, around the cleaning up of the tennis courts at the Davis, which had been overgrown, which um, is a problem that we have in, in many of our schools that have tennis courts. They're underutilized. Um, but Katie Balboni and Judy, Julie Belcher brought their students down to the Davis School, and along with some help from the uh, outside crew uh, in the custodial group, did an amazing job of clearing brush and um, cleaning up the court. And now it's a space that can be utilized by the students in the school uh, that wasn't able to be utilized before because there, there was so much overgrown brush and you couldn't really even get in. Um, so I, I'd like to thank them again publicly and um, I'd love to see more things like that um, happen because we do have some underutilized spaces, especially outside spaces um, in the city. That, um, and it would be great if we could maybe have an initiative. I know this is a long, this is a long term thing, but to revitalize some of those tennis courts um, or repurpose them. It would be expensive to do, but I think in maybe in the master facilities plan that could be addressed. Um, could be parking in some schools or you know basketball courts or skate park, whatever. But again, thank you to that program. That was a, that was a great yeah. thing. All right, job well done. Yes. Anyone else? New business, Mr. Sullivan. To take a minute to commend you, Mr. Mayor and Mr. Thomas, for last night. I just wanted the people to know that uh, a lot of work has been done on that MSBA program with, with you, Mr. Thomas, uh, and it was just a fabulous idea to create this master facilities. I, I'm well aware that the school department is the, probably the largest property holder, and then to put it all together and have the state pay 80% is fabulous. As a taxpayer, I'd love to see 20% and let somebody else pick up the 80. And I just wanted to commend both of you because I thought it was a fabulous idea and it's gonna work. This is what we need in this city is more ideas like that. I just wanted to say thank you. Yeah, actually, so I meant to mention it earlier, most of the school committee was there last night, but the city council last night approved a $900,000 borrowing to fund a master facilities plan for the city. It's something we've been working on probably for close to a year. It's something that the superintendent has advocated very strongly for. Uh, it's not limited to just the school buildings, but the reality is that the majority of the buildings are school buildings. Uh, but this facilities plan is also going to look at a possible expansion of the Council on Aging, going to look at our uh, old and deteriorating police and fire stations, uh, libraries, etc. But you know, clearly in the work Mike's doing <clears throat> to try to lay the groundwork with MSBA for some future school projects I think we all know we're going to desperately need, um, that in order to be able to compete for some future funding from the MSBA, we have to have a facilities master plan. And it's really been an oversight over the recent years that we haven't had one, um, because what hopefully it'll lead to is not just some good MSBA funding, but some realistic long-term capital planning of really getting a hold of what we've got for, for facilities, what kind of condition they're in, what, what needs to be repaired, what needs to be replaced, what are timelines, what are the, and, and looking at what the future needs of the city are and matching up the future needs of the city with the facilities that we've got and facilities we may need to develop. Um, so it, it's, it, it, it will be, I think, um, critical towards us doing long-term planning around facilities and, you know, along with police and fire, I don't think there's much question that um, we need a long, hard look at a 40-something-year-old high school that uh, I think is going to be uh, need a rehab and also needs technology because we're falling behind the more affluent suburbs in terms of what we've got for technology for our kids, particularly at the high school level. So I appreciate you bringing that up and I meant to mention that earlier because I wanted to publicly thank the, the city council because that's a, that's a city council action and the council did favorably approve that borrowing last night so that we can go forward with it. So 
uh, we certainly appreciate the cooperation of the council in funding something that the superintendent was pushing hard for. Nine forty-six. If anyone else has got anything else, it better be pretty good at this point. <laughs> Are we all good? All right. Motion to adjourn from somebody. Miss Plant. Motion to adjourn. Properly seconded. All in favor? Meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much, everyone. A lot of hard work tonight.